Ticonderoga class ship brief. The sources here are pretty limited. Uh, I got a lot of data uh, on this from globalsecurity.org and FAS.org. These two websites are fantastic. I bounced them off each other to verify their validity, their accuracy, and uh, everything checked out. It was great. Made my job very easy for this very complex lecture. Uh, the Drive, Navy site, DE, Sea Forces, and CBS News Report from May 8th, 1997 all contributed uh, photos to what you're about to see. Let's begin in 1965 with a major fleet escort study. So the Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, Mr. R. Murray, he set some objectives because they're basically evaluating the fleet status, what we need in the future. Um, and he's like, well, you know, post-World War II with uh, cuts and everything, we need to reduce construction cost. And this is an ongoing goal, you know, even t till today. Uh, use of modern manufacturing processes will help us with that. Uh, the new DX or DXG is going to result in the Spruance class design. And the Spruance class and the Ticonderoga class may look very similar to you at the waterline, and that's because they use the same hull. The hull for the Spruance, the destroyer, um, is a little bit too big for what it needs, uh, but they did that intentionally for the Spruance to give it room to grow uh, you know, in the future. And it was big enough to make another uh, DXG uh, that they were going to call the Ticonderoga class. Uh, so the same hull, same machinery, plant, things like that. Uh, but the cost savings, turns out, were not realized with uh, this new manufacturing process. Uh, while the escort study was a success, uh, the hull was much larger than, than, than required. So 1973, uh, the CSGN strike cruiser uh, begins testing new technologies for what they're going to put on the next generation. Uh, at this point, they're thinking destroyer. It's going to end up being a cruiser, though. So <clears throat> a new powerful cruiser is based on uh, nuclear um, cruisers, California and Virginia's d d design. So we're shifting away from the Spruance now a little bit. And looking at these other larger vessels, other designs anyway, California and Virginia. So their classification for this type of ship is a strike cruiser. So now we're beginning to shift our mindset away from destroyer to the next ship is going to be a, a cruiser after all. It's going to have SM2 SAMs, harpoons, uh, tomahawks, and a great ASW suite. It's going to be an all-encompassing uh, warship. In 1975, this is two years later, Congress mandates nuclear power on all strike force designs. And that kills any kind of cost savings that's going to happen to this. And so costs spiral out of control. Uh, the design is complete, but turns out it's too expensive to build. We can't afford it. So the CSGN project is canceled due to cost by President Carter's administration in the 70s. Aegis continues development and is tested on board USS Norton Sound. So here's a picture of the Norton Sound. You can see they have the Spy-1A radar, the first version of the Spy-1 radar. Uh, to actually see any kind of operational use uh, on board this ship. They also have the twin rail launcher, uh, the Mark 26 there uh, on the aft. And uh, they're just testing the systems, make sure that they can, you know, detect, track, classify, engage, intercept, you know, air targets. USS Norton Sound uh, is very important to this project because this is the test bed where it all began. Now, Aegis is basically a all-encompassing, you know, sustained combat operations vessel. Uh, it's a greatly revised Spruance class system. Uh, it's much more, much larger in scope than the Spruance is. Uh, it uses the same Spruance hull design. They end up going back to that, back, back to the Spruance class hull design, like I talked about. Because remember, that hull was bigger than the Spruance needed it to be. So it's kind of perfect for the Tyco, with some minor exceptions uh, that I'll talk about later. Uh, see, the Aegis Mark VII weapon system, this is the heart of what everything connects to. So whenever we say Aegis, we're talking about Aegis Mark VII. So on this, part of this weapon system is the Spy-1 phased radar, and there's going to be different variants, the A variant, Bravo, and Delta variant. And then there's also the Mark 26, Mark 41 launchers. Mark 26 is that twin rail launcher. The Mark 41 is what we're more associated with or familiar with today, and that's the VLS. Uh, banks that we'll get into. So no fin stabilization is fitted because she can draft three feet more than Spruance. She's displacing more water. Uh, therefore, they think that she'll be more stable and therefore she doesn't need these stabilization fins to keep her from rocking and rolling. This ends up being a huge mistake, by the way. I've known sailors that served on board the Ticonderogas and to a man, they all agree that when you're on the bridge, which is at the very top of that forward stack, 
Uh, the thing sways like you're on a carnival ride in any sea state. They should have kept the fin stabilizers on, but they didn't. Uh, Kevlar armor is wrapped around vital spaces like CIC, parts of the engine room. Um, not the entire ship, though. That's important. Uh, it was too expensive to do the entire ship, and it would add a lot of weight. Baseline zero units have a small amount of lead ballast for stabilization in the bottom. They took that lead ballast out. Kind of a big problem for future builds, like I said. But we're going to start with baseline zero. And there are four total baselines. So we're going to go from here and talk about all the different versions of the Ticonderoga. So DDG to CG on January 1st, 1980. This is when the Navy officially changed the name of the ship. Up to this point, they thought they were designing a destroyer. Turns out it's going to be a cruiser. And so what makes the difference besides tonnage? Everyone's familiar with tonnage. If you see a lot of tons, obviously cruisers are bigger than destroyers. Well, yeah. But why is that? What, what, what's the, the mission of the ship is really what makes it a cruiser. The Ticonderoga has command and control uh, capability. It has the communication suite with the data links to talk to other ships and communicate with them as if it's all one big vessel. The entire fleet is going to come under the Aegis fleet defense system. And uh, this is going to include long-range anti-air with some jamming capability, uh, ASW missions. So those picket ships out on the outside of the fleet are all communicating to one spot, and that's the command and control room on board the Ticonderoga-class cruisers. It is the most powerful surface combatant in any Navy when she's built. When she's built, this she holds the most powerful radar at the time. She has the most weapons of any ship at the time by a lot. Um, and just a lot of capability in here. Uh, her direct operation of fighter and helicopter assets uh, is a force multiplier. So she has all this firepower, everything from a five inch guns or two of them to these VLS tubes. But she can also dispatch airplane from the carrier wing uh, coordinated here to go and strike or identify targets. She is... 567 feet long, 55 feet beam, displaces 9,600 tons and does 33 knots in 60 seconds. That's right. She can go from a near standstill to 33 knots in about a minute. She's pushed by two controllable pitch, re uh, reversible pitch propellers. So the, that's the little blades on the propellers back there. They can you know, grab a lot of water or they can get real skinny and just grab a little bit of water. And what they do is at low speeds, they, they don't grab a lot of water because they don't have the torque yet. But as soon as they build up some momentum, they slowly start pitching their blades more and more to grab more and more water each time they turn in a, in a 360 uh, circle. And uh, that gives maximum performance. You know, think of your launch capability in your modern cars. You get up to the red light, you push the brake, you hit the launch button, you rev the engine. When the light goes green, you release the brake and that car maximizes acceleration to 60 miles an hour. Um, that's kind of the system that they have here on the Ticonderoga. It's a launch system. So here's the Aegis. Really cool shot of the inside of the CIC there. Uh, it's made up of four large displays. And th this will change over time. They get different consoles as time goes on. But generally, four large displays that the CO and the TAO, or Tactical Action Officer, can look at. Uh, they detect track, classify, and engage over 100 surface, su and air, and submerged contacts all at the same time. The processing power to do this is all in one spot. It's right here on the Ticonderoga. The SPY-1 radar provides 3D, 360 degree uh, contact information for 200 miles. It's actually a bit more than that, but you know, we'll say 200 miles. And 3D simply means that they give you the bearing, they give you the altitude, and the range. That's the specific point in space where this contact is. SQS-53C uh, sonar, which comes along in the later versions of the Ticonderoga. The earlier versions have the SQS-53 uh, Alpha Bravo. Um, but they all provide long-range submarine detection. That's what you want to get out of this. Uh, we'll talk about the, the different versions as we go along. The SH-60 Lamps ASW helicopters prosecute submarines with the Mark 50, the Mark 54 today. They also use the Mark 46 in the past. Uh, the Mark 46 is still in operation because it's very inexpensive and pretty capable. Uh, the SLQ-32V3, uh, that's your electronic warfare system. Uh, this thing is very complex and very advanced. It can analyze other radar transmissions. It can classify them, and it knows how to jam them based on what mode they're in. 
And uh, that is extremely sensitive information that we will not be going into, but they have it on board the Ticonderoga. All right, where are we building these? Well, they're, they're built in a couple different shipyards. The first one, where the Hull 1 is going to be built, is Huntington Ingalls Shipyard, uh, down there on the bank, east bank of the Pascagoula River on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this shipyard was founded way back in 1938, so it's been around forever. Uh, produces everything from nuclear submarines to large deck warships, those are like the amphib ships, and Coast Guard vessels. She became hunting in Ingalls Industries in 2011, and that's why... That's the name that she holds today. All right, baseline zero, Ticonderoga. This is where we begin. We begin with the Mark 7 Aegis weapon system. And under that, we have one Mark 26 missile launcher that can shoot the SM-1 and the SM-2 and the ASROC missiles. The Harpoon missiles are in two quad canister launchers back aft. We have two Mark 32 Mod 14 torpedo tubes that can shoot the Mark 46 torpedoes. Uh, the Mark 45 5 inch by 54 caliber lightweight gun mounts. We have two of those. We also have two Phalanx close in weapon systems, or commonly spoken CWIS. And that's for any, you know, close, low altitude a helicopter, plane, or specifically designed to shoot down incoming missiles at near water level. The Mark 36 Mod 2 Super Rapid Blooming Offboard Chaff System, uh, you know, puts up blooms of little tinfoil that kind of create this cloud that obscure the target of the ship to any, you know, radar or even infrared seeking warhead. And she has two originally SH-2 Sea Sprite Lamps helicopters. Later baselines will get the more advanced helicopters, but well, we're going to begin with SH-2s. All right, let's talk about... The Mark 26 guided missile uh, launching system. It is a fully automated system. You push a button and it does the rest by itself. You tell it to go, it goes. So it stows, it handles, it launches a mix of weapons. So like I said, it's got three different types of weapons it can carry. Uh, the SM-1, the SM-2, and the ASROC. And then they have three different mods for this. And each one basically is a larger magazine of missiles below the uh, launcher arms there. The mod zero is holds 24 missiles, mod 1 is 44 missiles, mod 2 is 64 missiles. All right, so the two types of missiles we're going to be talking about today are the RIM-66 and the RIM-67. Uh, we'll begin with the SM-1 and work our way through them. So uh, the SM-1 began operation in 1967. Uh, it is a RIM-66 medium range surfaced launched missile that employs both passive homing so it can home on jam or home on signal and semi-active homing so once it's up there in the air another radar somewhere else in this case from the ship has to direct it to the target it gives it a more precise point to a home in on so semi-active homing or it can just passively home in on on a target it has a, a dual thrust rocket motor uh, the RIM-67 variant, remember there's two variants, RIM-66, RIM-67. The RIM-67 variant is the one photoed on the bottom side there, and it is an extended range with a mid-course guidance detachable booster rocket. That's why it's so much longer. Look at the size of the booster rocket. It's about the size of the missile. They've almost doubled the whole length of the missile by adding this enormous booster rocket that's detachable after launch uh, onto the back of it. And there's an integral sustainer rocket motor in the nose or in the forward part of that missile. That's the RIM-67, and that's the difference between the two. RIM-66, no booster. RIM-67, big booster. But they're all, they're both the SM-1 uh, standard missile. And this SM-1 was phased out of the U.S. inventory in 2003. There are other countries around the world that still have these missiles in their inventory. Whether or not they're operational is beyond the scope of this. The United States does not use this missile after 2003. All right, let's talk about the SM-2 and all of its block variants. There's lots of different variants of this. Basically, each variant gets a little more capable. It's just, that's the easy way to think of this. So block two, uh, three, three alpha, three Bravo, three Charlie. Then you have four and four alpha. Uh, four alpha is where we're going to end up eventually. And it's going to take us 27 you know, Ticonderogas to tell this story. So we're just going to begin with baseline zero here. Talking about the SM-2 uh, missile. 
This is the Navy's primary surface-to-air fleet defense weapon. It's derived from the SM-166. Okay, that's the starting point, 66 Bravo specifically. Um, it can do Mach 3+, plus, has a range greater than 50 miles, and is ECM resistant. So the target, if it's got an ECM pod, they can turn it on. It may help, but it's not going to guarantee that this missile doesn't hit it anyway. It has a solid propellant fuel with tail controls. So little fins back there that steer it in three dimensions. It has mid-course correction, semi-active radar homing. So after it you know, launches and it's on its way to the target, it will begin looking for the uh, fire control radar, essentially, that's bouncing off the target, and it homes in on that fire control radar, you know, illuminating the, the uh, target. Uh, it can be used against surface targets. Um, it has that capability, but uh, it's primarily a surface-to-air weapon. All right, so Block 2. Block 2 of the SM-2 improves its ECM capability. It also has an improved fuse on its warhead. So it's more likely to get a kill whenever it reaches uh, its, its uh, detonation point. The Block 3 improves low-level intercepts because we're not going to wait for that missile to get close to us to let the Sea Whiz handle it. We're going to start shooting the sea-skimming um, cruise missiles that are coming at the fleet farther and farther out. And that's what Block 3 gives us. Block 3 Alpha is a high-velocity warhead fragmentation, which means the, the impact point uh, isn't always directly on top of the target. So if you have a high velocity fragment warhead, the, the fragments can take up, you know, in a, a volume of space that either the airplane or the cruise missile that you're shooting at is going to fly through and rip itself apart if it doesn't hit it directly. And with a higher velocity warhead, the faster that target is, the less, uh, it, it's not going to increase its chances of getting away because the the high velocity warhead expands so quickly compared to the block two and block three. All right, block three Bravo has a dual mode. It has an RF seeker and infrared homing as well. So it doesn't necessarily need to rely on that uh, dedicated fire control radar. It's gonna look for it, it, it wants it, but it also has infrared homing as well in case uh, that helps against uh, countermeasures like chafe and things like that so if it loses its target but still has an infrared uh contact it can home in on that infrared contact as a backup that's block three bravo block three charlie is a very short range rapid rocket motor uh vectored thrust uh very accurate missile it's designed to shoot down incoming weapons that are coming at it at supersonic speeds and so they sacrifice a little bit of range for very rapid engagement. That's Block 3 Charlie. Block 3 Charlie can shoot down airplanes, absolutely. But it's designed to shoot that really fast incoming cruise missile. Block 4, overall improvements. It has increased range, increased performance, increased reliability. Block 4 is the gold standard. Everybody in the SM2 series is trying to get to Block 4. Block 4 incorporates all the previous improvements. And Block 4 Alpha, Block 4 Alpha, that's where we're going to end up by the end of this lecture. Block 4 Alpha is the theater ballistic missile defense system. It is what's going to be shooting down those short range and intermediate range ballistic missiles on their terminal phase, uh, on their boost phase. You know, we're, we're going to reach out and we're going to knock down ballistic missiles and anything less than that, too. You can still use these against you know, airplanes and incoming weapons if you want to, but uh, they're very expensive, and so they're going to use them against the ballistic missiles. And the Ticonderogas will go out with a variety of these missiles. They don't just all carry one block. You know, you're going to have a little bit of block 3C for that very short-range engagement. You're going to have some block 4 Alpha for uh, ballistic missile engagement, but you're not going to fill up your Ticonderoga with block 4 Alpha. Let's talk a little bit about ASROC. ASROC's terrifying weapon for the Submariner. Uh, the ASROC comes in uh, two different varieties. The RUR-5, which is the rail launched. That's the twin launcher with the arms. And it has the RUM-139, which is the VLS from the Mark 41 VLS launcher that we're going to get in the next baseline. So ASROC is a ballistic missile. A lot of people don't know this. It's a ballistic missile. Unguided missile doesn't go very far. It's not intercontinental ballistic, but it means that it just has a parabolic course. And so you fire it in a direction. It's unguided, 
Once you fire it, it's just down to the laws of physics in that rocket motor, and it's going on a journey. And it's going to land somewhere and deliver one of two packages. It's going to land, it's going to de deliver a Mark 46 Mod 5 torpedo, or a W-44 nuclear weapon, nu nuclear bomb. Now, the VLA has vector thrust to provide some direction after launch. That's um, with the uh, RUM-139 that comes out of the vertical launcher. It has to have vector thrust to tell what direction to go in, whereas the twin arm launcher on the M Mark 26, uh, it just points the arm in the direction and at the elevation that it wants the par parabola to go. So if you aim it, you know, near, near, nearly straight up, it's going to have a very short range, but a high parabola, you know, or if you can aim it lower to the horizon, it's going to have a very shallow parabola, but a very long range, right? And there's a sweet spot in there for maximum range. Well, with the, with the VLA, it's going to be, you know, ejected vertically, and then it needs little vectors to go left, right, you know, go this way. Now, once it's done that, it's, it's, it's on its ballistic course after that, but it does get a little bit of help from this vectored thrust if it's uh, launched vertically. Uh, in 1992, the ASRock incorporates the Mark 45 nuclear torpedo that goes 40 knots. So just in case you want that nuclear you know, mushroom cloud underwater to be a little bit closer to the target, they stuck it on a Mark 45 torpedo and uh, it goes towards the uh, target before detonating a 20 kiloton uh, explosion. And there is a picture of it right there. That is a 20 kiloton uh, submerged explosion. That's what it looks like. You don't want to be a submarine anywhere near that shock wave because it will crush your hull like a tin can. Okay, so the AGM-84 Harpoon and the SLAM standoff land attack missile. It's able to shoot these. In 1977, the sea launch version was operational. And in 1979, the aviation variant comes along. That's for the AGM Mark 84. It's 15 feet long, 13.5 inches in diameter, and about uh, 14, almost 15,000 pounds, and does 855 kilometers per hour. Produces 660 pounds of thrust, has a range of greater than 60 miles, and that range is variable depending on the type of harpoon. And for instance, there's an extended range slam that goes well over 100 miles. You know, it's, it's very long. But all the missiles, greater than 60 miles, it has 660 pounds of Destrex explosive and um, is about 5,900 of them in the United States inventory at any one time and even less, about 90 in the United, in the United States Air Force inventory. And uh, these missiles, as they age out, you know, parts of them because they're modular will get chucked. But that's about what we keep in the inventory there. Just to give you an idea. You know, if we have to get into a long term engagement, we're going to blow through these uh, numbers pretty quick, you know, and, 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 and Tomahawks is much less. There's a lot more than we have in Tomahawks. So low level sea skimming weapons uh, use mid course correction guidance with a uh, radar seeker to attack ships. Uh, standard anti ship missile. It's subsonic, like we said up there with the speed. Uh, the SLAM is used, was used successfully in Operation Allied Force against a mobile SAM unit. Now, to be fair, the mobile SAM unit wasn't moving at the time that it was hit, but it was a tracked SAM unit over in the uh, Balkans during the Kosovo War. And uh, that is the only recorded, at least publicly, uh, use of the SLAM against in wartime. You know, we have lots of training with it, but uh, we used it in Allied Operation or Operation Allied Force successfully. We'll talk a lot about that operation coming up. All right, let's talk about the Mark 32 surface vessel torpedo tube or SVTT. There's uh, one of these mounted on each side, so two total. Handles the Mark 46 and Mark 50 torpedoes, can shoot the Mark 54 as well. Uh, it's a pneumatic launching system. There's a little you know, flask in the back that looks like a sphere. It holds 1,600 pounds of air, it's rechargeable. Uh, a little side note, it was originally rated for 1,500 pounds of air, but they increased it to 1,600 pounds of air just to give it more oomph. And um, so if anybody out there that knows a lot about the system, that 1,600 pound uh, was, was not the original pressure of the flask. They did change that. All right, the Mark 46 Torpedo. You can see it up there on the chart. She's uh, a little bit bigger than the uh, Mark 44, a little bit smaller than the Mark 50. Uh, she's operational in 1967, and she gets an improvement in 1979 Mod 5. And so since that's before any of these Ticonderogas are even built, they're going to be getting the Mod 5. Uh, it's widely used around the globe. It's a very reliable weapon. 
you know, proven over and over again in all sorts of exercises. Um, it's a product of a 1956 study from on submarine warfare. So that's kind of how these work is you have a study, you know, white papers written by experts, and then that study is used as justification to develop a new system. That's, that's exactly how the Ticonderoga came around. Remember that fleet study from the 1960s? Well, they do these studies all the time. And a study from 1956 on submarine warfare led to the creation of the Mark 46 torpedo. It is a two speed monopropellant engine. Uh, we call it auto fuel, specifically auto fuel two, because uh, there is an auto, auto fuel one that we don't use. It's very dangerous. Uh, it's 8.5 feet long. It's 324 millimeters in diameter and can do greater than 40 knots. It has a range of only 1,200, 12,000 rather yards and a 508 pound warhead on it, which is enough to do the job for just about any submarine. Um, they'll punch a hole in a submarine for sure. Uh, larger submarines with lots of watertight doors, you might have to punch them twice. But uh, it's either way, if it hits the submarine, it's going to get a hole in it. It has passive and active ac uh, homing, acoustic homing. And the Mod 5 has a uh, shallow water performance upgrade, which is really important because uh, most of the naval engagements we expect to have in the future are going to involve shallow or littoral environments. And so the Mod 5 is very important for, for those environments. The Mark 45 5 inch by 54 caliber lightweight gun. This became operational in 1971. It's a fully automatic lightweight gun mount, has a range of about 13 nautical miles. Uh, can shoot 20 rounds per minute and has a 500 round magazine. It's uh, both anti-ship and anti-air capable. Designed for anti-ship, but there is a HE round that can uh, shoot down incoming missiles or uh, nearby airplanes. There is another round that's in development that is um, GPS guided. And uh, it's got stabilization fins that allows it to glide after launch. And that has a range of nearly 50 miles. But... Uh, that that program is so expensive it's it's hardly ever used so uh, we're going to just talk about the standard 13 nautical mile range 20 round per minute uh, capability of this gun this is very good against pirates off the coast of somalia as we'll talk about all right here's the mark 50 advanced lightweight torpedo it's the little brother of the mark 46 but extremely advanced this thing is a nightmare if you're a sonarman and it's coming after you Okay, the Mark 50 program was initiated in 1974, had very troubled development. Yeah, I mean, like decades in development. It officially finally saw service in 1992, but then it had reliability problems. So they finally get it in the water after about, you know, 15 years. And the thing is inconsistent. It doesn't run right. And they're like, ah, so now they got to fix that engine uh, problem. And, and part of the problem is they overreached a little bit. They, the engine's very advanced. It's very efficient, it's very fast, and it breaks because of that. So uh, in 1997, the Mark 50 testing is finally successful in Autech. And um, I was there, and I can't talk about it. So there you go. Uh, it is 9.25 feet long. It's uh, 324 millimeters in diameter, same as the Mark 46. It is 40 knots plus and 775 pounds uh, with a 100 pound shaped charge. That's 775 pounds, the entire weight of the weapon. It's extremely light for a torpedo. Has both active and passive homing. Uh, closed cycle chemical reaction propulsion. So kind of, kind of like a battery. It's a fancy way of saying battery, but almost like an energy cell battery, like a really powerful battery. Uh, see, it's the best airdrop torpedo in the United States inventory for sure. It's even better than the Mark 54. So you might be wondering, well, why you know, Mark, Mark 54 came after the Mark 50? Why is this one better than that one? Well, the Mark 54 is basically a Mark 50 with the Mark 46 engine, which is a little bit slower, therefore not as capable, but it is more reliable. So you got that going for it. And there are limited quantities. This is a very expensive weapon. It's insane how much this costs. And it's because of all that technology in the forward half of that weapon. That little nose cone has crazy amounts of technology in it, making it very expensive. All right, the Mark 15 Phalanx close-in weapon system is tested in 1977 on board USS Bigelow, Operation 1978. Uh, total weapon system consists of two. A lot of many of you don't know this. If you have the entire Mark 15 weapon systems, you don't have one of these. You have two of these 20-millimeter uh, gun mounts. Each mount has its own search track radar. Automatic engagement, anti-ship missiles, and aircraft, or in manual mode. You can manually fire this thing. 
It has a 980 round magazine with a 3,000 rounds per minute armor piercing, discarding Sabo tungsten rounds uh, after 1988. Uh, before 1988, I believe they were using de depleted uranium, which was uh, ridiculously expensive and a waste. So they went to tungsten rounds after 1988. Uh, future upgrades uh, saw an increase in fire rate, an increase in magazine size, and they also added some sea sparrows on the really new ones. And so you'll see a, like a missile launcher uh, below where the radar mount is on some of the future upgrades. But those are not on the Ticonderoga, so we're not going to talk about those. Just know that there's lots of different variants, including rounds per minute and magazine size for the Sea Whiz. But we're just going to go with the baseline here. Uh, it also is integrated into the shipboard ECM and FLIRS and, and other sensors. It does not have to be. It can be completely independent because this thing is designed as a less you know, chance for defense against an incoming weapon. And it's assuming in its design that the ship may already be damaged. There may not already be, uh, the ship's radar may be gone. So it has to have its own everything from sensors to magazines to weapon, you know, it, it's self-contained. All right, here's the Mark 36 SR Bach or super rapid blooming offboard chaff. <laughs> this is a deck mounted mortar type countermeasure. Basically it's a tube. Yeah, it's a tube, just tube they put on the deck, uh, but it's got a little charge in the bottom like a mortar round has. And on top of that charge is a little bit of, it's a chaff cartridge. Um, but they have different types of chaff cartridges too. They have like a little, there's an IR cartridge. It can shoot what looks like a flare, but it's chaff and flare. Anyway, we'll get to those. Uh, launching chaff cartridges to confuse incoming missiles creates fal false signals. So this is really only good against an active homing uh, seeker head that's you know emitting RF radiation. Now, torch charges produce heat to deceive infrared seekers. And that's the, the combo, if you will. Uh, it's got a little, looks like a flare, kind of. But then it's surrounded with a cloud of chaff as well. And each launcher is in a six is uh, six fixed angle tubes. Four are set at 45 degrees with two are a little more upright at 60 degrees. And you can see the difference there in the picture. It's combat proven, highly reliable and cost effective. And uh, there's always a nearby deck locker that holds reloads for it. So you can have some volunteer sailor get out there during the battle and reload these things real quick if he needs to. Would not want to be that guy. <laughs> All right, here's the helicopter, the SH-2C Sprite. Now this one has the lamps on it. Uh, LAMPS is a very specific upgrade that's made for uh, anti-submarine warfare or naval activity, so LAMPS. They, uh, they can carry two Mark 46 ASW torpedoes or two Mark 50 uh, advanced lightweight torpedoes. It can carry a Mark 11 depth charge or two Penguin anti-ship missiles. can also shoot two, this is one on each little stubby wing by the way, two Sea uh, Skua anti-ship missiles and there is a mod where they can shoot the Maverick missile. Now, I've never seen a Maverick missile even on one of these things, but they have the capability to um, <laughs> to fire the Maverick missile. They can also put on rocket pods, the uh, two and three quarter inch rockets. Uh, it's powered by two GE T700 401 turbo shafts. Max load is uh, 13,500 pounds. It can stay in the air about four and a half hours. Uh, it has a range of 450 nautical miles at 120 knots. Uh, ceiling is about 20,000 feet. Really doesn't need to go any higher than that. It's a multi-role helicopter, which means it's not just ASW only. It's got a surface search radar there too. So it can provide over the horizon tracking and searching with the radar and then communicate that information back to the Aegis Mark VII combat system. That's what it does. It also has an AQS-18 dipping sonar. Uh, it has an ARR-84 sonar receiver. It's essentially the sonar system um, receiver built inside the helicopter that then transmits the sonar buoy data to the ship. And the ship does all the beam forming and stuff like that, or does all the processing, I should say, more specifically. Uh, it has a MAD, that's a magnetic anomaly detector sensor on it, and it has the LN-66 radar, like we said. Uh, the AKT-22 is the data link, specifically from the helicopter back to the ship. There's all sorts of data links that's going to be connecting all over the fleet. Uh, it's this specific one that connects the helicopter to uh, the Mark 7 Aegis system. All right, Baseline Zero Ticonderoga class has the following sensors on it. We've already gone over the weapons. That's what we just did. So the sensors are the SPY-1A radar. This is the hallmark. This is the heart of the Aegis system. This radar is amazing. 
And it was just a technological, you know, leap, uh, generational leap from any other radar before it. It also has the SPS 49 air search radar, not new, but they've modified it. They've improved it. Uh, it has the SPQ nine gunfire control radar. That's for the five inch guns, the SPG uh, six, two fire control radar. That's for the uh, missiles. And we're going to go into all these SQS 53 alpha, the early version of the home mounted sonar, not as good as the new one, but they've got it. Meaning this is a multi-role ship, ASW, anti-surface, anti-air and command in control. It does it all. And then the very secretive SLQ 32 V3 electronic warfare suite. That's a scary little thing. It can destroy incoming missiles if it gets a good enough look at them. That All right, let's begin with the spy one radar, uh, the advanced automatic detection and track multifunction phased array radar uh, is a four megawatt radar track. It can track over a hundred targets and shoot them. And remember, every target uh, needs to have guidance uh, radar on it. So the, so the missile can home in on that, on that radar beam. So it's shooting down multiple targets while tracking over a hundred targets and guiding missiles to the specific targets that it's de designated uh, a missile to. It's a very long range volumetric search that includes the ability to detect ballistic missiles in uh, later builds in future builds. Uh, it's an S band radar, which means it's two to four gigahertz. But what that means to us is that it's good in all weather conditions. It's, it's very good. So it provides mid course corrections to semi-active homing missiles, like we said, and has a rapid power up of only 10 seconds. Older radars that had the tube base solid state amplifiers, those would take longer to, to warm up the tubes. And as the tubes and amplifiers got warmer, they would become more efficient, pushing more power to the radar array. Well, we don't need that for this, for, for this array. Once you power it on 10, 10 seconds later, it's broadcasting, it's ready to go. And the salvo rate is less than two seconds per launcher. So it can go between launchers very quickly. It has a short target illumination before launch. In other words, it can identify a target quickly, uh, resolving its course, its altitude, its speed, and then calculate an intercept point, you know, in a very short time. Uh, it's radar sensitivity is configurable by, by the operator, which means you don't always need to, you know, maximize your power. You can, you know, tweak the power so you can fine tune the uh, clarity of, of, of your, of your display. And that's dependent on the environment. So the operator has the ability to change modes, gains. That's all very important to the trained uh, radar operator. Automatic response and reaction to threats. This is a huge improvement. Aegis can be left on its own and say, defend the fleet. And then you give it uh, criteria, anybody within 100 miles, anybody closing greater than 500 knots, anybody you know below 20,000 feet, you know, and it takes IFF into consideration and you can just tell it to kill and it will go, it'll defend the fleet for you. This is very important whenever a mass attack comes over the horizon, like from the Oscar two or one of the larger vessels like the Kirov, you know, they're going to try and overwhelm NATO's fleet defense. This was designed to prevent that from happening. This is the counter to those platforms. The short distance to the horizon due to the array mount is a bit of a vulnerability. So they mounted these arrays as high as they can on the Ticonderoga, but you know, still not as high as say the SPS 49, which is the air search radar above it. And whenever it comes to radar and the horizon altitude or the height of the array means everything. So there is a little bit of a liability here in that you have a short distance to horizon with uh, the Ticonderoga and the Arleigh Burks. It cannot engage targets on other sensors originally, uh, unless it's also tracking. So, uh, let's say the SPS 49, which is their very powerful air search radar detects, you know, an incoming flight of bombers that are still 250 miles away. They're just barely coming into radar range. Well, unless the Aegis has it on its spy one radar, it will not engage it. You know, you can say, Hey, it's coming. It should be on this radar in a few minutes, but then you just got to wait. Yeah. So that, that, that's a limitation to it. Uh, once the target is uh, engaged, a second weapon will not be launched until the first missile passes the target. And uh, this is a limitation of just the first generation of spy ones. Uh, they quickly corrected this in future 
But once you engage a target, it will not re-engage until it knows for sure that the first missile missed. And you don't always have the luxury of that time. Putting two missiles on one target is a common tactic, especially on anti-ship uh, missiles, because you cannot afford to shoot again. You don't have time to shoot again. So you give yourself two chances to kill it. That is a big limitation here. So the SPS-49 air search radar. So this is a very powerful radar. This thing is very long range. It's a two-dimensional radar. It gives you range and bearing. So it doesn't give you altitude, right? Just range and bearing. Uh, it can go up to 100,000 feet in altitude. It looks out to 250 miles. Uh, if it's a smaller target like a fighter, it may be a little bit closer than that. Um, it's uh, 850 to 942 megahertz. It does have an auto detect function and it can estimate a contact solution. It's got that built into the circuitry. Um, electronic countermeasures, uh, counter countermeasures capable. So people that are jamming, they can operate the system to try and get through the jamming if they want to. Medium pulse repetition frequency upgrade increase detects, de increased detection of stealth uh, aircraft. And that's because of the way the, of the stealth design is. Uh, if they use the pulse repetition, there's a little bit better chance that they get a return off of it than just a continuous wave one or Doppler one. Uh, so the, the 360 uh, kilowatt peak power has a, um, a PRF, which is a refresh rate of uh, so several different modes. It's got 280, 800, 1000 uh, pulses per second. Uh, the pulse width is about 125 uh, mill milliseconds per pulse. The way you get those other pulses is you do different pulses in, di in different directions. Keep in mind, this is a spinning 360 degree radar, and that's how you're getting the high uh, PPS there or PRF. Uh, the built in test that automatically automatic detection faults. This is a common thing to have now. But back when the SPS 49 came out, this was uh, very unique, very nice to have built in test that you could run and say, oh, OK, the radar doesn't work. We ran this test. We know the array is you know not rotating or whatever. So instead of going out and looking at it, you could just, just, just run the test. Now, I do want to draw your attention to the left-hand side where I put little arrows going into the, the, the beams. These are detection gaps is what I am choosing to call them. And basically, it's just a gap in coverage after a certain distance. As you look at the bottom of the scale, that's the range in miles. So that range, you know, it's going out to, what, 300, 400, you know, what miles out there? And the height going well above 100,000 feet. Uh, but you can see where there's a constant bloom. That is the area of 100% detection. You know, something in there, it's going to get detected. But the further away you get in range and the lower you are to the water, the closer you can get before this, this SPS-49 will see you. You know, it should see you out to, well, you know, maybe 90 miles if you're sea skimming, if you're a sea skimming missile. But it may not. You know, you may be able to get into 40 miles before it finally sees you. And with supersonic anti-ship missile, cruise missiles, it may be hitting you before you see it on your on, on on your radar. So it's definitely very long range, very powerful, very capable, but it's not perfect. Here's the SPS-55 surface search radar. Solid state component technology, uh, the surface search and navigational modes, uh, which means that it can see like the shoreline and you can plot the shoreline on the uh, on the display and measure distance to shoreline. That's very important whenever you want to stay out of, uh, you know, territorial waters and international waters. You know, you want to distance to shoreline. It has a range of over 50 nautical miles, has a reduced clutter on the screen, automatic gain control. So it'll adjust its own power to give you the best picture. It does have a sec sector scan capability, which is really important. That's basically where you point it in a direction and say ra ra radiate this way plus or minus 30 degrees or plus or minus 45 degrees, right? And that's called a sector scan. It is a, a 10 gigahertz with minimum peak power of 130 kilowatts and has a 16 RPM. So round uh, ro rotations per minute is how this thing rotates. It's a 1.5 degrees accuracy on the horizon. So good enough to navigate by. That's the SPS-55 surface search radar. SPQ-9 radar. This is the surface surveillance and tracking radar. This is an X-band radar. Also uses Pulse Doppler. Uh, this track wall scan radar uh, controls the Mark 86 gun fire control system. And the fire control system is what controls the guns, those five inch guns. So you're going from this radar 
to the control system that turns the guns, elevates the barrel, and then fires the weapon. It can be used in shore bombardment, can be used in the anti-surface with limited anti-air capability. It's effective against sea skimming missiles. So in the uh, Ticonderogas have a uh, five inch gun on the bow, five inch gun on you know back aft. At least one, if not both those guns are gonna be shooting at the incoming missiles if there's a swarm attack. Uh, the SQP-9 Bravo is an upgrade, which greatly increases its sensitivity and accuracy, which translates to more accurate gunfire. It's very important. It has a 360 degree azimuthal search out to 40,000 yards for surface contacts and uh, a 20 nautical mile range for missile detection. So once that once that missile gets into the 20 nautical miles, whether the SPS-49 has seen it or not, this radar will definitely pick it up. All right, here's the uh, SPG-52 fire control radars. There are four arrays mounted topside. I've highlighted two of them here for you. Uh, this is a Raytheon RCA IJ band fire control radar. It's 20 gigahertz. It's a continuous wave transmission. So once this thing starts radiating, it just goes uh, for the Mark 99 fire control system. It provides terminal guidance for the SM2 rockets as well. Because that phased array radar is going to be very busy tracking those hundreds of plus contacts and it needs uh, guidance for the SM2. It's going to use these to assist in that mission, in that job, uh, providing guidance to the SM2 missiles. It works as a second radar to the SPY-1 for target illumination. It's a 7.5, uh, 7 feet and 5 inch diameter antenna with a 10 kilowatt peak power. And there you see two of them. All right, the SQS-53 Alpha Sonar. This is an active and passive hull bow-mounted array sonar. It can detect surface contacts outside of radar range. It's very common to get surface contacts before the radar gets them. And it's computer controlled by digital computers. And that's very important because, you know, before this, uh, it was very likely that the computers were me mechanical. Computers were, were, were mechanical long before they became solid state. And, uh, but this is all complete electronic solid state at this point. And there's a few pictures of the displays there with the happy sonar operator. And, uh, the photo you see on the bottom left is a screen grab from one of my analysis of the SQS 53 sonar system on the right. You can see the bow dome we're talking about extremely powerful hydrophone there. I mean, that thing can drop the base. And here is the secretive SLQ-32 electronic warfare system. I was fortunate enough to get this uh, training slide that had an example of what the R-17 window or the operator display uh, would look like in, in certain modes. This is in the threat engagement summary mode. Uh, this first became operational in 1979. Uh, had like two years of development pretty quick. Uh, provides warning, identification, and direction to radio frequency transmissions. So, you know, it could be a ship out there with a radar on. It gives you a classification and a bearing, power level, all this information. It's basically active intercept, but active for radar active. Uh, it gives you early warning for incoming missiles. A lot of missiles will have their own type of radar system on the missile. This will detect that and say, hey, you got a missile coming at you. You know, just more information for the Aegis Mark 7 to process and display to the commanding officers. It has an electronic attack and jamming targeting terminal system, uh, so it can try and jam those missiles before it hits the ship. It also uh, they had to install radar absorbent material in uh, frame 174, so that's a bit aft of uh, the CIC and all that, uh, to, pre to protect sailors from radiation. Uh, whenever this SLQ-32 wants to try and destroy an incoming missile with um, basically an EM pulse in the direction of the incoming missile, uh, that pulse was enough to hurt human beings. So they had to install some uh, protection there to protect us from, from the radiation. Very powerful system, very sensitive, very secretive. Uh, this is all we're going to talk about with it. Okay, Mark 47 Ticonderoga. Hall 1, folks, we're getting started here. Uh, keel was laid in 27 January 1980. So very easy to remember, Ticonderoga. Construction began in the 80s, in the very beginning. Uh, it was launched by First Lady Nancy Reagan. 
um, began its first test in class under went about two years of system testing because it's the very first one they built. They got to test everything. They're writing procedures in some cases, um, but they finally do get it commissioned about three years later in 1983. Uh, the Washington Post. Uh, I remember this this headline that came out because talk about a shot heard around the world. It says stand by Admiral Gorshkov. Aegis is at sea. Admiral Gorshkov uh, referring to the top admiral of the Red Sea fleet of, of Russia's fleet. 1991 Operation Southern Watch near Iraq was one of her first major deployments, uh, keeping an eye on S- Saddam Hussein and his air force coming out of Iraq. Let's skip ahead to 1995, Destin Glory. Destin Glory is a huge amphibious NATO exercise, goes on every year. But this year, uh, they're in the Mediterranean. And they're invading South Sardinia by Greece, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, Turkey, uh, the UK, and us, the United States, led by USS Theodore Roosevelt, an aircraft carrier. And the USS Ticonderoga is organizing the air defense. This will be called Air Defense Co- uh, Commander going forward. So they're the air defense commander for this exercise. So all anything air related reports to the USS Ticonderoga and then they make that decision or they pass any decision making capability up to the admiral if they need to. But they are entrusted with coordinating the and organizing the the air defense of this rather large amphibious group. In uh, 1996, they're assigned to Operation Deny Flight off the coast of Bosnia. And that was part of enforcing some U.N. uh, resolution over there in the uh, Kosovo War. Very complicated. But you'll notice as we go through these, it is very common to have a Ticonderoga in the Adriatic Sea looking to where Yugoslavia used to be is now Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, you know, in that in that region, the Balkans, we'll call it very common. All right, so the two year 2000 smart ship upgrade, and all the ships are going to get this. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a redesign, basically, of the engineering spaces and the bridge spaces to reduce the number of watchstanders they need at any one time. And there's a great example of that in the picture on your left-hand side. You can see all the different uh, responsibilities, equipment operators and supervisors, you know, multiple people operating this 1960s technology uh, engineering space to just a few people on the right hand side using modern computers to communicate with each other and systems communicating with each other so they can easily see uh, everything that they need to know at their fingertips in terms of pressures and temperatures and you know rotational speeds of the shafts and the engines you know it, it greatly reduced the number of eyeballs it took to keep track of everything because of improved user interfaces and increased capability between the computers in 1999 uh, The USS Ticonderoga returns to Naval Station Pascagoula, which is there where she was built for a 14 month refit. And she gets this smart ship added. It adds uh, 27 dual 200 megahertz Pentium Pro based computers running Windows NT 4.0, which at the time was, you know, the bee's knees. Uh, The smart ship integrates communication, uh, ship operation, damage control and the CIC over fiber optic networks. This is long before fiber optic became very common. And they're they're installing it here on the Ticonderogas. This reduced manning by an estimated 10% on the ship. Smart ship upgrade. Very important upgrade for the Ticonderoga class. Unitas. Unitas, man, whenever I was in the Navy, everybody wanted to go on the Unitas. Unitas is basically where you go around South America, whether you're going from Pacific side to Atlantic side, doesn't matter. And then you eventually go through the Panama Canal to get back to your home base. Uh, if, if you can, if you're in a ship that fits in it. But as you go around South America, you visit all the ports, Rio de Janeiro, you know, all of them. It's great. Never got to do it. But the USS Ticonderoga did. And she did that in October of 2000 after she got that smart ship upgrade. So this is a multilateral Navy training fleet around South America. So as we go around and we, uh, you know, meet the Brazilians, we meet the Argentinians, you know, we do little, you know, war games with them just for a few days as we go around. So it's not just, you know, a PR visit. There's some actual training that happens during these unit toss. My point is very fun. Every sailor wants to go on one of these. In 2001, uh, the flagship for Destroyer Squadron 6. So after the Utah is done, she comes home and becomes a, a flagship, which is a big prestige. And she's also designed to be the flagship. She's the center point of fleet communications of any fleet she's in. 
So it makes sense that she'll be the flagship. Uh, she participates in Team South, which is a series of naval exercises with the Chilean and UK forces. In 2004, her final deployment is to the South Pacific in Caribbean Sea, where she busts uh, drug boats, and we call those drug ops. And she's officially decommissioned in September 2004. CG-48 Yorktown. This is Hall 2. She's laid down in 19 October 1981, launched in 83, and finally commissioned on the 4th of July 1984. August 1985, the Achille Laurel hijacker uh, in, intercept uh, happens uh, where the Achille Laurel, that was a, a passenger vessel uh, who was operating in the Mediterranean. Uh, some terrorists get on board, take over this passenger liner full of people. And so she's sent to go and intercept the Achille Laro in the Mediterranean. Now, by the time she gets there, the Achille Laro incident is already, you know, winding down. They had, uh, unfortunately, I guess, murdered uh, one of the passengers on board. It was a real mess. But in August of 1985, she was dispatched to go and escort the Achille Laro. In 1987, she received Top Gun Award for gunnery. In 1989, uh, she had a Black Sea encounter with a Russian M-Class frigate. You can see a picture of that there on the left. That's the Russian M-Class frigate trying to um, ram her, essentially bump her out of the way. This picture is very important because I want you to look at the bottom left-hand side. You can see the tubes for the chafe launchers and right next to the tubes on the American ship I'm talking about, uh, you see the SLQ-9. You see that... Um, electronic countermeasure and defense and those are the projector arrays on them again very secretive system not a lot of public information about it but there you have a very clear photo of, of what we're talking about those things are designed to obscure the radar return of the ship for one and then they have a mode where they can try and damage the electronics of incoming uh, planes anything with a radar radar essentially they can overwhelm it with power directed specifically right at it and and try to fry it the range and capability of that is not public but i want you to know that it's there and it's amazing it works okay that's the uh, 1988 incident with the uh, russian frigate in the black sea and in 1991 she's awarded the old crows for electronic warfare excellence no details were given as to how excellent she is but we know that her ecm uh, warfare is off the chain in 1991, she did deploy uh, to, to the Med during Desert Storm. Uh, operation to provide comfort to the uh, Kurdish refugees after the actions of Desert Storm. She uh, stayed there for that as well. 1992, she's going to what we're going to call Balt Ops. That's uh, a deployment to the Baltic Sea where we work with our NATO allies up there. And we have a lot of them. And that's a big war game. That happens every year. But check this out. In 1992, after the war game... She visits Severmorsk, which is a, um, a large Soviet or Russian base, naval base, up on the Kola Peninsula. This is like one of the first times that's happened since the end of the Cold War. So, you know, we're getting off on the right foot trying to improve relations with Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, 1993, she's awarded the Battle E, E for Excellence. It's a very prestigious award to get for any ship or submarine. Uh, she also goes to Caribbean again for drug intercept operations. And in 1994, her air warfare commander, she is air warfare commander in the Adriatic Sea from her med deployment. We're going to be seeing a lot of these. Very common to be in the Adriatic Sea with this system. Because in the early 90s, that Kosovo war was very ugly and very hot. And there was a lot of UN resolutions about no-fly zones. Those are being enforced by these Ticonderoga-class cruisers. Continuing on to 1995, the prototype, she's a prototype for the Smart Ship program. This is the same program that was installed on the Ticonderoga. The Yorktown, though, is the prototype for uh, testing it and making it work in 1995. This, again, reduces manning and increases readiness through technology. Has a total of 16 workstations that are connected with fiber optics. Uh, it uses land technology to link damage control, navigation, and other systems like we talked about. Uh, it's a very good system and it works great so much so that they invited CBS, a American broadcast news broadcasting to come and do a piece on it. And there's a screen grab from it there from May 8th, 1997, I think it was, was when they reported that. 
but she got this installed in 1995, 1996. Uh, she changed her home port to Pascagoula, um, Mississippi. In 1997, uh, the Caribbean encounter, she went on a Caribbean uh, drug deployment to go and bust uh, drug ships in the Caribbean. That's something else that they do a lot of, too. The Ticonderogas, as we go through all 27 of these, you'll find operate in every sea around the world that is connected to the United States anyway. It's, uh, they're all over the place. I can't imagine a place that is not landlocked like the Caspian Sea where they haven't uh, deployed. In the year 2000, she dry docks for maintenance. Uh, in 2004, she is out of that maintenance period and taking part in Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and Mark, Market Time 2. Those were all back-to-back uh, operations while she was over in that same theater. In uh, 2004, she's in the Red Sea now. And uh, she responds to a call for assistance for an oil tanker, Mount Everton. Uh, she ends up rescuing the crew from this oil tanker that is on fire. In December 3rd, 19, or 2004, rather, she is decommissioned from service. So both, both the first two ships, Ticonderoga and Yorktown, are decommissioned in the same year, 2004. Long distinguished service. Very proud of the Yorktown. And that's it for the baseline zero, guys. Now we're moving on to baseline one. This is where we're going to see our first improvements of the um, of the Ticonderoga class. One of the first things the Navy's going to do is get rid of those old helicopters. Let's get some SH-60 helicopters with the LAMPS-3 modules installed on them. This is going to greatly increase their over-the-horizon search, track, detect of surface ships and submarines. Uh, it will have a hull-down system for deck maneuvering. So even in a high sea state, they can mechanically roll these... Um, helicopters out of the hangar, you know, and release them. They can also lower a hovering helicopter with this haul down system rapidly in like two seconds and, uh, and then bring it into the hangar without anybody having to go out there and attach anything to it. It has the SQQ uh, 28 helicopter data link. So an improved data link. It has the SM2 block two missile. So we're getting an upgrade medium range SM2 missile now starting with uh, the baseline one. A just improved data displays. That's just going to improve user interface, basically. Uh, electronic warfare capabilities improved. We don't know how by how much. That's not public. Um, the masts are reduced to tripods. So the they're going to reduce the weight a little bit by reducing the quad pods because they had four legs holding up the mast down to just three into a tripod design. All right, here is the new helicopter, everybody. This is called the SH-60. It has the LAMPS-3 module installed. So the SH-60 in general is an all-purpose helicopter used by the Army, Air Force, everybody uses it. Well, whenever it's on board a ship, it will have the LAMPS-3 um, ASW suite installed. So it, this helicopter enters service in 1984. It has the IBM LAMPS Mark III system on it. it has a more powerful T-700 engines than the uh, Sea Sprite had. Uh, they added two weapon pylons, so it can hold more weapons, including a 25 sonar buoy dispenser with the SQQ-28 data link. It did have an emergency flotation system uh, installed under the um, wheels, under the landing gear, but they removed that. So apparently there was some problem with this emergency flotation system, uh, and it wasn't clear or stated clearly what that problem was. So for a brief time, they had some sort of flotation system and then they didn't have it. So something went wrong there. Not sure what it was. Uh, it's an ASW platform primarily, even though it does those other missions. It shoots or drops the Mark 46 and Mark 50 torpedoes. Uh, you could add the Mark 54 to that as well. That's the more recent uh, torpedo. It has an anti-surface warfare uh, surface radar and anti-ship missile capable. It can shoot those. Uh, those are the smaller ones like the Sisuka and the Penguin missile and even the Hellfire missile. Uh, it has a search and rescue role uh, as well as vertical replenishment. So whenever ships are resupplying at sea from the big supply ship that's following the fleet around, you'll see these helicopters doing vertical replenishment sorties just looping from the supply ship to uh, the ship that's getting the um, cargo dropped on them. And also medical evacuation. If you have a severely injured sailor, especially on a submarine, uh, they'll dispatch one of these helicopters and they'll hoist them out of the sail of the submarine in this example uh, to safety or to some medical facilities. Like the big amphib ships and the aircraft carriers, they have fantastic, essentially hospitals on board. And um, so you could get a medical evacuation to that. 
Here's the hull down system I was talking about. It maneuvers the, hull, the helicopters around the flight deck. You can see the tracks right there. And you can see how everybody's, they don't need to get up close to the helicopter or do anything with it. They can just be standing out there. They don't even really have to be on the flight deck. Uh, but in the picture, they're there. Uh, they can retrieve helicopters with rapid assist, secure, and traverse. Um, or RAST. The SM-2 MR Block II missile is pictured there on the right. It has a solid fuel rocket motor with a tail controlled. You can see the little fins on the back, those pivot to push the nose up and down as it's flying through the air. It has higher speed than the Block I and is much more maneuverable. And is also good for high altitude intercept. So we're getting closer and closer to that ballistic missile intercept, but we're not there yet. We can just shoot down those really high altitude uh, reconnaissance planes or bombers. Um, that are very, very far away. It has a single processor upgrade from the Block 1, so it's a little more nimble in its calculating intercept points as it's going through the air. Because remember, this requires mid-course correction and home in on the uh, radar, the, the, the fire control radar. It also has improved fusing and warhead. All right, CG-49 Vincennes. Um, keel was laid in 19 October 1982. She's launched in 84 and commissioned on the 6th of July, 1985. The first Ticonderoga class to enter the Pacific Fleet, specifically San Diego. Something about these home ports, uh, the home port that they may initially go to, in this case San Diego, is never the home port that they stay at their entire career. They tend to move these Ticonderogas around from uh, home port to home port you know, every 10 or so years. So just because she begins her life in San Diego doesn't mean she'll spend all of her time there. In 1986, she tested the SM-2 medium-range Block II missile. In uh, 1986, she also de deployed with the USS Carl Vinson to uh, the Pacific and Indian Oceans. We'll often call that a Westpac. So if I say Westpac, we're talking about Western Pacific uh, deployments, South China Sea, East China Sea, and in a lot of cases, Indian Ocean as well. In 1988, Fleet Exercise 88-1 was interrupted with a return to port for reassignment. What's going on? They were in the middle of their fleet exercise. They're told, come home now. And that's because in 1988, they were assigned to a joint task force for Middle East. Operation Earnest Will. They're going to be protecting shipping going through uh, the, uh, the Straits of Hormuz and in the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq tanker war. Uh, what, what's happening is Iran and Iraq, they're in this really nasty war that's a stalemate. And one of the casualties of the war is these oil tankers. Is Each side is bombing the other side's oil tankers as they pass through the Straits of Hormuz. They're also hitting ships that don't belong to either country as well. And so the United States is going to begin escorting tankers through the Straits of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf. So the Vincennes is doing this job now. And here come some Iranian small gunboats out to conduct an attack on a tanker, everyone thinks. So the Vincennes um, aggressively uh, engages the Iranian small boats before they can get to the tankers and themselves. They're also defending themselves from these uh, small boats. So they begin shooting five inch shells at them and uh, it gets it escalates rapidly from a simple escort mission to a gun battle. Uh, suddenly new aircraft appear on radar. So it looks like the Iranians from Bandar Abbas are reinforcing their small boats as the small boats try to run away and evade these five inch uh, shells. The Vincennes, determined to kill these little ships, begins chasing after these little uh, fast boats that have guns and RPG wielding sailors on it back towards Iranian water space. Uh, some claims that they had violated Iranian water space chasing uh, this boat in this gun battle. And this gun battle has been going on for, for a while now. Well, they mistook a scheduled Airbus Flight 655 from Bandar Abbas to Dubai as an F-14. Uh, this is a little unacceptable, I guess, or it was, uh, because, one, it's a scheduled flight. Um, it's gaining an altitude, going right at the Vincennes, but not taking any evasive maneuvers, and it's not responding to any calls on the radio. Now, the not responding to calls on the radio, you know, if it's a hostile, the, you, you, you would expect that. But you wouldn't expect an F-14 to just fly straight at a uh, AAW-capable warship without 
taking any evasive maneuvers or, or doing any hostile action. It's simply in a steady climb from 10,000 to 11,000 to 12,000 feet as it's beginning to fly over this gun battle and ranges get down to like eight miles. And then finally, um, the uh, Vincennes authorizes two SM2 MR Block 2 missiles to shoot the F-14 in quotes down. And well, the F-14, of course, was a civilian transport plane, an Airbus, you know, a commercial airliner full of people. 290 people on board that Airbus when it was hit by both SM-2, MR Block 2 missiles, completely destroying the airplane. That was a big problem. Um, obviously, <laughs> killing 290 people is a huge problem, but it took diplomatic relations to a whole new level. There were lots of statements made by the president and the CNO. It was a real sad day for everybody. You know, obviously the Navy looked terrible. They're involved in a gun battle that they're being aggressive in, violating Iranian national waters and then shooting down this uh, civilian air transport. It was just a nightmare. Uh, 1990, the Vincennes is deployed to Westpac in the Indian Ocean after that incident, after the investigation's over. Serving as command and control ship, uh, she provides Aegis Shield for the fleet. So that's kind of what they're calling this. Um, capability with the Aegis Mark Seven combat system. It's a shield over the entire fleet, uh, whether it's you know from the air or from the sea, Aegis protects the fleet. In 1991, the next year, while deployed with USS Independence Carrier Strike Group, she goes on a Westpac, that's Western Pacific, uh, steaming around there. She does um, another Westpac with USS Kitty Hawk in 1994. So she's still a pretty high tempo uh, ship. And we're going to see this tempo increase as they build more and more of these Ticonderogas. Three years later, in 1997, she changes her home port to Yokosuka, Japan. So this is the first big home port change that we've seen. From 1999 to 2001, she conducts deployments annually with carrier groups. So each year, it's a different carrier group or different, yeah, different carrier. But she's going out with all of them. And since so she's already forward deployed in Japan, she doesn't have that transit time. She just waits for the carrier to come from the States. And whenever the carrier arrives, she goes out to greet him and goes on Westpac with him. In 2001, she uh, returns to the Persian Gulf uh, to support Operation Enduring Freedom. And that's just another one of those post-Gulf War uh, operations where they're enforcing a uh, no-fly zone and other, other things. She's finally de decommissioned in 2005. But the shooting down of Flight 655 will always hang over the head of the Vincennes. That was an unexcusable mistake. CG50 Valley Forge. Keel was laid in 14 April 1983, launched in 1984, and finally commissioned in 18 January 1986. Assigned to Destroyer Squadron 2 in San Diego, California, 1987. She's uh, initial deployment to Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and she also participated in Ernest Will, in the Persian Gulf. So she got a lot of ribbons for that deployment because each one of these is its own e event. Uh, very good for the crew and everyone's, um, you know, career as well. In 1990, she supports Desert Storm and Desert Shield, providing air protection. She's that, you know, air um, coordinator, air defense coordinator. In 1992, she returns to the Arabian Gulf. This is after Desert Storm is over and uh, supports Operation Southern Watch and Restore Hope. These are just two back-to-back -back operations that are involved in the post-Gulf War climate. In 1993 to 1995, she deploys three more times off of South America doing anti-drug operations. In 1995, she uh, joins a, a Russian-U.S. war game near Hawaii. So remember, we already had um, a Ticonderoga visit Severnensk a few years ago, 1993. Here we are two years later. We're doing naval war games with Russia. The early 1990s is really showing a new relationship between the United States and Russia. We, we, we have a chance here to form, a, you know, a defensive strategic bond and, and go forward into the 21st century to, together. And it's looking like it's going to happen in the mid 90s. 1996, 1998, she deployed twice to the Western Pacific. Uh, in 2000, she deploys near uh, South America again for drug interdiction. Very common mission. Like I said, these Ticonderogas are all over the globe. 
In 2001, she gets her smart ship system installed. That's the one that reduces 10% manning. And she was decommissioned in 2004. 2004 was a very bad year for the Ticonderogas. We are decommissioning a lot of them in 2004. All right. We said that they build these in two different shipyards. We're finally getting to the Bath Ironworks in Bath, Maine. They're finally getting around to building their first Ticonderoga. All these up to this point have been built down in Mississippi. Bath Ironworks is a quiet little shipyard that builds some really cool ships. They've been around since 1823, one of the oldest shipyards in the United States. They've produced thousands of vessels over two centuries. Their homepage website claims to have built 5,000 vessels, but I did the math on that and that seems unlikely, <laughs> but they do build a lot of fishing vessels. So it is possible that they're building, you know, mass quantities of small fishing vessels. Anyway, thousands of vessels over two centuries, very experienced shipyard in both civilian and military ships. Uh, they sit on the Kennebec River. And in 1995, General Dynamics purchased the company. So uh, now they're known as General Dynamics Bath Ironworks. But an absolutely historic uh, United States shipyard. If you're outside Navy circles, this may be your introduction to it. Just know that this is uh, a brand that is respected in Navy circles. Everyone knows Bath Iron Works. Okay, and they're building CG-51, Thomas S. Gates. Keels laid down in 31 August 1984, launched 1985, and commissioned 22nd of August 1987. So the Thomas S. Gates was Secretary of Defense during the Eisenhower administration. That's why he's getting this ship named after him. It's one of the few ships uh, in the cruiser classes that are named after a specific person. It's not the only one, but it's one of the few. In uh, 1989, they do a, a port visit to Sevestable Crimea in the Black Sea. Now, in 1989, that's before the fall of the Soviet Union. So that is a Soviet Union port. So that's quite, uh, quite a visit there. In 1990, 1991, uh, supported Operations Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Uh, in 1998... Uh, the first in class to receive the integrated controls program. That's a cost saving program where they combined a lot of functions um, in the ship systems. You'll see a lot of that. And if one of the ships gets these like this integrated ship controls, that's already rolled into the next baseline. So we're still in baseline one. Whenever we get to baseline two, all these little improvements are already in future baselines. Okay. In the year 2000, a flagship for Standing Naval Forces Atlantic, or Danex 2000. That's a, um, a war game over with NATO fleets over there in the um, North Sea and, and North Atlantic as well, not just North Sea. Okay, cross-deck training between NATO ships happens, and this is something that doesn't happen often enough. I hope they start doing this more, but you can take crew members and officers especially, and you'll just take a couple and exchange them for their counterpart on the other ship. So if I am a enlisted sonar supervisor, um, I will go to the other ship and replace one of their qualified sonar supervisors. And, and he'll take my position on my ship for the whole war game. And we'll just learn what other sides, you know, procedures are, uh, how, other, how the other side thinks and works. And we just share tactics and, you know, it's also just a good way to get to know the people you're going to sea with because you're isolated on these little islands we call warships that we're all working together, but rarely do we ever get to meet face to face. So it's a great way of doing that. And uh, so that's called a cross deck. So cross decks are something navies do. And uh, I think we should do them more often. Anyway, in 2004, four years later, circumnavigated South America escorting the USS Ronald Reagan to San Diego because she wouldn't fit in the Panama Canal. She had to go the long way around. So uh, Thomas S. Gates escorts her around South America. Uh, she's the last of the first five Ticonderogas not selected for modernization for cost reasons. So she is on the chopping block already, and she is finally decommissioned in 2005. So they had to make a choice. They could modernize her and keep her, but the Navy wanted to save money and go forward with other programs. And so they took money out of this program to fund programs that were coming online in the early 2000s. Baseline two. So we've learned from baseline one, baseline zero. Uh, we're taking all those improvements and we're adding to those improvements a Mark 41 VLS. 
This is a weapons battery that is enormous. It's going to hold a lot of missiles. Gone are the twin arm rail launchers. They're, they're old and busted. They're not coming with us. We're ripping those out, replacing them with these very large vertical launch systems. They can launch the Tomahawk weapon system. Uh, the Tomahawk uh, would not fit on the arm of the Mark 26, so they had to uh, go, go to this system here. Uh, the lar- it has a larger magazine. It has a faster fire rate and 360 degree coverage. So if you look at the old baseline zero and one with the Mark 26 twin arm launcher, they couldn't shoot back towards the center of the ship. That's why you had a launcher on the front launcher on the back. So in order to get 360 degree coverage, you had to either turn the ship or choose the launcher that was in the right direction. Well, with the VLS, you don't need to turn the ship. You can just eject the weapon vertically. And once it gets above the superstructure, it has little vector thrusters that tells it which direction to go. And it rockets off that way. Uh, all missiles are stowed vertically in corrugated steel containers. I'll show you a picture of this in a second. Uh, it has ASW sonar upgrades. CG 54 and 55 have standalone towed arrays called the SQR 26, essentially a tactical towed array. Um, a 24 foot rigid inflatable boat or rib uh, is installed so they can do small boat actions. That's really important whenever you're doing inspections because they're doing a lot of escort duties. And uh, if you're fighting pirates uh, or rescuing, you know, hostages from a ship that's occupied by pirates, you need these small boats just to get small tactical teams from your big warship to the tanker that's being held by pirates. That's one of the many uses of these versatile small boats. Uh, they finally upgraded to Link 11 Data Link. This is a very good uh, communication link that links all the fire control systems and sensors to every ship in the fleet together. Just an improvement there. And in 2003, uh, Baseline 2 Ticonderoga classes are going to get installed the Theater Ballistic Missile Defense and Cooperative Engagement Capability. This is a $137 million upgrade per vessel. And this is really what Aegis was envisioning in the beginning. The most important of these, well, they're both important. Obviously, the theater ballistic missile defense is good for you know, stopping a nuclear attack. You know, you can't really top that. But this cooperative engagement, the CEC, is, is the dream. It's where this one ship controls every weapon, every sensor in the fleet. So if a sensor on a picket ship on a that's off on the horizon says, hey, we have a submarine, uh, we need a weapon on the submarine at this position, a hostile submarine, the Ticonderoga with the CEC can choose an, an airplane, a helicopter, and say, hey, you go over there and drop your weapon. Or if the ship has an ASROC, it can say, hey, you launch your ASROC and, and hit that submarine there. And it's all controlled by one cooperative uh, net, net, net network. And um, that's what the CEC is. It's a great upgrade. Baseline two. Here we go. Let's take a look at the Mark 41 vertical launching system. This thing is awesome. Uh, again, it's a multi-missile storage system and firing system. They fire right out of the containers that they come to the ship in. The missile never leaves the container until it's shot, which is, makes handling it much safer and easier. Each module has eight cells. So if you look at the Mark 41, you see it's a series of just eight cell uh, modules, right? But there's only 61 missiles per Mark 41 launcher. So, so why is that? Well, that's because one of the modules has a crane, and I'll show you the crane here in a second. So it's not, it's not eight cells by eight modules equals 64 missiles. It's eight cells by eight modules equals 61 missiles because three of the missiles are used for a at-sea loading crane. The standard loadout for the Ticonderoga is 80 SM-2 missiles. 16 Azrocs and 26 Tomahawks. That is certainly not the case. Every time they go to sea, that is just the baseline standard loadout that they can then tweak for whatever mission they're going to go on during their deployment. They have two Mark 41 VLSs for a total storage of 122 missiles. This is an arsenal ship, ladies and gentlemen. This ship carries an immense amount of firepower in its Mark 41 VLS alone. And this is just one weapon system of many. Here's a picture of the Mark 41 VLS forward of the uh, main superstructure on Ticonderoga. And there you can see the three um, 
cells, if you will, uh, that do not hold missiles. And they're, they're welded together like just one door instead of a set of three doors. And if you open that door up, here's, you'll, you'll see a, a crane that, that, that pops out. This crane can be operated by a crew member and they can load these, these corrugated steel containers at sea from a ship that's bringing them to them. So they don't need to pull into port to reload is the point. It's a very difficult and dangerous operation to, uh, re to reload these at sea, but it can be done. All right, here's the SQR-19 Tactical Toad Array. Remember, in the beginning, some of these ships uh, just got this as a standalone. Later on, it was integrated as part of the ship itself. As you see here, this is one that's in the under the fantail. This is under the flight deck for, or actually, it's underneath the uh, where the gun mount is, uh, back aft. And uh, you can see that's the big stowage reel for the SQ. R19 tactical toad array. Those are a bunch of sonarmen reeling it in there with probably some A gangers watching over them, make sure that they don't get their hands crushed by the hydraulics. But this provides very long passive sonar detection for submarines. Obviously, you can hear ships too, but if you're going to detect a submarine passively from a Ticonderoga, you're going to do it with this toad array. It's a very long uh, toad cable of hydrophones, and uh, they tow it about 2,000 yards but behind the ship. And uh, that's approximately one nautical mile. So keep in mind, if you see these ships in the middle of the Pacific or the middle, mi middle of the Atlantic, you don't have to worry about just running into that ship. You don't want to be running behind that ship for at least a mile because you could end up scooping up this tow array and damaging it. That's happened before. They had some uh, Russian submarines have picked up surface ship tow arrays on their rudder, and uh, that turns into a mess. Here's the Mark Link 11 uh, data link. Uh, I was actually shocked to find these on the internet, but well, there you go. I guess it's declassified now. Uh, this is how we talk to each other. This is how we used to. Obviously, we've grown on from Link 11, which is why these aren't sensitive anymore. But here, here are the frequencies that uh, fire control systems talk to each other with. So you have a pilot frequency and that's used for Doppler because the Link 11 is going to be on helicopters, going to be on airplanes. A lot of things that are moving around are going to cause Doppler to shift these communication channels up and down the frequency. So we, we have a pilot frequency there on the left that's very loud. And whatever Doppler we see on that pilot frequency, we just add to the 14 or subtract to the 14 other channels that are in 110 hertz steps. And uh, so you can have, you know, was it 14 plus one communication channels at any one time with link 11. And this used to be the latest thing, but uh, nowadays it's, it's been superseded by two generations of links now, uh, which makes this look archaic. But I remember serving in a day when this was a uh, state, state of the art and uh, it just simply isn't the case anymore. But this is how computers talk to each other. They have little radio channels and they can send their little BOD messages over each one of these channels. And, uh, well, and, and what we have now makes this look primitive. I thought you might like to see that. All right, CG-52 Bunker Hill, keel laid 11 January 1984. She's launched in 1985 and commissioned 20 September 1986. First to employ the Mark 41 VLS with 122 missiles. In 1987, she takes part in Redex. Uh, 87.5. Uh, so the 87.5, the 87 is a uh, the year the naval exercise happens. Uh, the 5 is the uh, fifth iteration. So like in the year 1987, they must have done four other exercises. Um, and so this is just like the fifth one. So uh, she's the AA coordinator or air defense coordinator. Uh, those are interchangeable terms for the battleship Missouri during deployment to the Persian Gulf. Her home port's in San Diego, California. In 1988, uh, she moves her home port to Yokosuka, Japan. In 1990, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Tomahawk launches, and uh, she's the Air Warfare Commander for Desert Storm. A very prestigious position to be in for the United States Navy to be the Air Warfare Commander for the Navy side of things uh, during any conflict. And Bunker Hill got that honor. In 1996, she monitors a Chinese missile test in the Taiwan Strait. Chinese don't like that, but there's nothing they can do about it. 
1998, the Arabian Gulf deployment. Uh, that's a very common deployment. Uh, if they don't go to the Persian Gulf, a lot of times they'll just hang just outside the Straits of Hormuz. That body of water is the Arabian Gulf. She also uh, moved her home port back to San Diego in 1998. Like I said, they don't stay in any one home port for uh, long periods of times, it seems. She participated in RIMPAC 2000, which is a very complex, I believe it's the largest naval war game in the world. Uh, and it's an uh, either annual or biannual game uh, that involves just about everybody. You know, sometimes there was a year where we invited China to come and uh, participate with us and Russia too. Yep. So RIMPAC 20 or 2000, she's there with USS Abraham Lincoln, provides humanitarian aid to East Timor uh, during that. East Timor is a uh, small country north of Australia that has seen lots of uh, natural disasters and self-inflicted political disasters, including starvation and stuff and, and military violence, you know, and, and unrest. And so um, humanitarian aid to East Timor occurred in 2000. 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, rescued oil platform workers from the Persian Gulf because, uh, you know, they were being threatened by, I believe it was Iraq at that time. And, uh, oh, we were invading Iraq for the second time there. So they were getting the uh, oil platform workers out of the way in 2003. 2004, we provided humanitarian aid to Indonesia after the tsunami hit. You may remember the big tsunami that hit in 2004. Uh, unfortunately, killed a lot of people. It was a terrible tragedy. And so we provided humanitarian aid for them as well. In 2009, we deployed with the USS Carl Vinson CSG Carrier Strike Group in the Pacific. 2010, I provided humanitarian aid to Haiti after the earthquake. So you can see how, you know, the Navy really is, it's a military force first, but because our presence is global, we're in a position to provide all this help to many nations around the world. So, uh, Every Navy person that I've talked to is very proud of that. And uh, we have a great history of doing that with other nations. In 2011, uh, she performed anti-piracy duties off the Gulf, go, ah, Gulf of Oman. In 2012, she went to dry dock for maintenance and stayed there for five freaking years. And the dry dock maintenance period, whenever they get these modernization upgrades that we do not go into because they're sensitive upgrades uh, that are still being employed today, uh, you know, these can take a long time. So it is possible that a four year enlisted sailor get assigned to the Bunker Hill in 2012 and his enlistment is up and he's out of the Navy before she ever goes to sea. That would be a terrible enlistment for any sailor because you would never do anything interesting. Uh, but she stays in dry dock or in a maintenance availability. Let's put it that way. Not always in dry dock for as many as five years. Uh, 2017, uh, she deploys again to the Persian Gulf. Part of Carrier Strike Group 9 supports them. She is planned to be out of commission, also called decommissioned, in 2023 and put into Fleet Reserve. Uh, Fleet Reserve is basically the ghost fleet that's up there near Bremerton, near uh, Seattle, Washington. And uh, they will eventually be scrapped or torpedoed in a Sinkex. But for a short period of time, they're uh, placed in a reserve. CG-53 Mobile Bay. Kill was laid in 6 June 1984, launched in August 1985, and commissioned uh, 21 February 1987. She's home ported in Mayport, Florida. In 1989, she begins her first deployment in the Gulf of Oman. Uh, from there, 1990, she's moved from Mayport to Yokosuka, Japan. Uh, clearly the all the way around the world, basically, opposite side of the world. Uh, in 1991, she participates in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, shooting 21 tomahawks. That is quite a bit for, uh, for them. In 1993, she deploys to the Arabian Gulf. In 1994, she participates in RIMPAC. That's that big uh, exercise in the Pacific with 50 other warships and is also part of a Westpac. So Westpac would be the deployment that happens either before, during, or after the uh, RIMPAC. 1999, five years later, she deploys to the East China Sea during the Crab Wars for fishing right fights. So that's where uh, it was Korea and Chinese fishermen were going at it. Uh, I believe some people got hurt. Uh, some fishing vessels were sunk. And so we send in this uh, Ticonderoga class cruiser and a few other small ships to just calm everybody down. Those were called the Crab Wars. Uh, 1999, she's sent to East Timor to, pro to provide support and uh, military security for ground operations. Uh, this is a time when Australia is taking an interest in East Timor, trying to prevent that 
country from becoming a failed state because the last thing Australia and New Zealand and a lot of those other countries in that region, the last thing they want is a failed state uh, in their region because that's where you breed you know, non-state actors like terrorists and you end up with terrorist attacks in Sydney. You know, nobody wants that. So uh, Australia and other countries are sending in peacekeeping troops, if you will, even though I don't believe they're called that, to calm things down in East Timor, add some stability to it. Along with those troops is the USS Mobile Bay off the coast providing support. In the year 2000, the next year, she changes her home base to San Diego. 2001, she does drug operations off the coast of South America. 2002, she does a Westpac with the Abraham Lincoln Battle Group. In 2004, she supports the reinvasion of Iraq. <laughs> Remember that invasion began in 2003, but you know the support there lasts many, many years. In 2007, she's dry docked for maintenance, and she doesn't see the light of day until uh, 2011. Uh, after a long dry dock period like that, it's very common to have an in-serve inspection. Uh, an in-serve inspection is an inspection, you know, re required by Congress to happen randomly on a certain number of ships, submarines, and commands um, every, every year. And uh, you can get one back-to-back. -back. Sometimes that happens. It's completely random. But whenever you come out of an availability period, it's very common for you to be selected for an in-serve inspection. And, ba and basically what that is, is they ask you to operate every system on the ship from the most simple light switch and breaker to the most complex fire control system. And they say, OK, now that you've turned it on, operate it in every mode, you know, turn that five inch gun turret 360 degrees up and down in every elevation. And it just takes days and days to do it, usually about a week. And then you come up with a report in the end saying, hey, these systems work. These systems didn't fix your ship, Captain. And uh, in 2011, after they came out of the dry dock period, they failed their in-serve inspection. They had problems with the propulsion system, uh, apparently pretty significant ones. And something with radio, uh, their ability to communicate, which is really important for especially, a, you know, a ship like this. Uh, they're, they're CIC, Link 11, something didn't work in the communications field. Again, they're not specific as to what's broke for security reasons, uh, but they, they, they had to fix that. Uh, it's already been decided that she will be decommissioned in 2023. So pending any kind of congressional intervention between now and then, Mobile Bay will be out of the service in 2023. The next ship was CG-54 Antietam. Uh, Kiel Laid is in 15 November 1984. She's launched in 86 and commissioned 6 June 1987. She's home ported in Long Beach, California. 1988, she deployed the Arabian Gulf, escorting Kuwaiti tankers, a job they're very familiar with doing, and they do a lot, especially in the 80s, during the tanker war. In 1990, she deploys to a Westpac but was interrupted by Desert Shield, and she became the first air warfare commander during the first days of that operation. In 1992, she does another Westpac with eight other countries. And it's very common to have, and even more common now, to have a lot of different nations sail with you on your Westpac now. It's always been the case, but it's becoming more common now. In 1993, deployed to the Arabian Gulf for Operation Southern Watch. That's again, one of those post Gulf four operations where they're enforcing no-fly zones and uh, embargoes. Basically, UN resolution enforcement. 1984, 1985, she goes into dry dock and overhaul and ends with her new home port in San Diego, California. In 1997, she returns to the Arabian Gulf, this time with USS Kitty Hawk, uh, for Ernest Will and Vigilant Sentinel. Uh, these are two operations that happen very close to each other. So a lot of times if you get credit for one, you're also part of the other one. Either way, she gets both. And this is in response to Saddam Hussein's troop movements to the Kuwaiti border. It looked like he wanted to do, you know, Gulf War 2.0 in 1987. He's acting very hostile, but he sees the reaction. He knows he can't do anything to stop the Americans and the coalition. So he backs off. He does not invade Kuwait a second time. This is another great example of how dictators and belligerent nations uh, need to be confronted. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to go to war with them to, to, to do this. This is an example here where we confronted Saddam Hussein a second time militarily without a shot being fired and calm things down. So there is a place for that uh, strategy in this world. 
The next year, in 1998, RIMPAC exercise there in the Pacific. Uh, the year 2000, she does anti-drug operations near South America. In 2001, she deploys uh, during the September terror attacks and takes station in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, on November of 2001, she's pulled off station for search and rescue of two crew members of the USS Peterson. Uh, I do not believe that that search and rescue was successful. Um, she does a port visit in India, which is one of the first times that's happened in a very long time. And it turns out to be a great uh, change or a pivot point, if you will, in diplomatic relations between India and the United States. Uh, it was broadcasted and celebrated heavily in India that the Americans were here. Everyone, the sailors be behaved themselves. Um, and it was just a great PR moment. And I like to think of this port visit for, by the Antietam as being one of the points in history where we began to bring India into our fold. Because remember, during the Cold War, India had very close relations with Russia and was using a lot of Russian equipment. And while they were not communist, they were using Russia to support their own military. And now we're beginning to make inroads and building relationships with port visits like this. In 2005, uh, she circumnavigated the Earth, which is one of the rare accomplishments that you can get in the U.S. Navy to, in one deployment, do a complete circle, the Magellan Award, and get the Magellan Award for, for doing that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that one myself, but they, they did it in 2005, so good job to them. In 2007, they redeployed to the Persian Gulf. Uh, no incidents, though. In 2013, she's re-homeported again to Yokosuka, Japan, uh, moving all over the place. In 2017, while at anchor, a strong wind pushes the ship uh, and spills oil into Tokyo Bay. So she, she basically ran, ran aground there, and she ran aground at anchor, which is very rare. But if you look at the Ticonderoga, it's got a huge superstructure that is boxy. So on a windy day, uh, where the wind can push your ship around just like a sailboat gets pushed around. And even though that they were at anchor, there was enough wind to drag the anchor and push the ship to a shallow point. And then it just cut a, enough of a hole in the bottom that some oil leaked out, freaked out the Japanese because they don't. And a lot of times they, they don't want the Americans there to to begin with. And whenever they contaminated the bay with oil, it became a, a political tool for the people that don't want us there. To say, see what they're doing to our waters. So it turned into one of those situations. But um, a lot of people got fired for this because they should have uh, known that they were moving. They should have known that the wind was pushing them and that the anchor wasn't holding them. And they took no action. And that lack of action from the command level uh, caused a lot of uh, people to be fired. All right. The next year, 2018 to 2020, they complete a multiple of Freedom of Navigation Act actions in Taiwan Strait. That's simply sailing from the East China Sea to the South China Sea uh, in the Taiwan Strait between mainland China and Taiwan. Every time they do that, the Chinese communist Chinese protest. And then we just do it again anyway. But she is scheduled for decommissioning in 2020. We may not see the Antietam uh, after that. The next ship is CG-55 Lafayette, Lafayette Gulf. Uh, in 18 March 1985, she is keels laid. She's launched in June 1986 and commissioned 26 September 1987. 1988, home port in Norfolk, Virginia. In 1991, she's deployed to the Persian Gulf for Operation Desert Storm. In 1993, she, she participates in Fleet Week in New York City. And this is going to be really important in the future. New, New York City and Boston and San Francisco, a lot of these major cities have what they call our fleet weeks. And they invite the U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, any ship, basically, come in, enjoy the city. They roll out the red carpet for the sailors and everyone has a good time. People get so civilians get to tour the ships and see what their tax dollars are paying. Uh, and it's just a great time for everybody. And they, they do this every year, typically. And it's going to begin building relationships between the U.S. Navy and the people of New York City. And that's going to come into play in 2001. But back in 1993, uh, after they're done with the Fleet Week, they conduct communication and naval exercises with a Russian destroyer right off the coast of New York City in uh, off, in off the coast of Virginia as well. Uh, there's a little operating area there called the Vay Capes. And so we're doing, uh, you know, naval exercises with post-communist Russia in the early 90s. You know, it's going to be a whole new 
21st century we're thinking at this time it, it the, the future is looking very bright you know no more cold war uh mor- mor- morale is very high at this point 1995 she deploys to the arabian sea 1999 four years after that she's deployed to the adriatic sea to support allied force this is going back to that kosovo war in uh, 2001 she scratched in quotes the sonar dome near virginia beach with no damage other than to, to the paint um it's technically a running aground but it was so minor there really was no disciplinary action taken but in 2001 after the terrorist attacks in new york city uh she races up there to the coast uh and anchors in the harbor of new york and provides humanitarian aid and as much help and assistance as they can possibly provide after the 2011 attacks in 2007, the Layette Gulf catches fire while in dry dock, and five workers are injured. So it's a pretty significant fire, but it didn't destroy the ship. They put the fire out, but some people got hurt. Uh, in 2011, uh, while deployed off the coast of, of Somalia, she's doing pirate patrol, uh, they capture 75 pirates. Like, this whole gaggle of pirates was operating with a mothership, coordinating them. It was very loose coordination, but... They captured the the entire lot of them. They took all of them. (laughs) So uh, I don't know what they do with pirates from Somalia uh, after they capture them. I wonder about that because uh, if they return them to Somalia, that's a basically a stateless country, even though they technically have a government. Uh, It's not the the government does not have control of the entire country is my point. So I don't know if they would uh, return them to Somalia or not, or maybe keep them somewhere else like Guantanamo. Uh, In 2015, a six month deployment to the med. That's a common deployment with, uh, Absolutely no incidents, which is great at this point. And 2001 time of this recording, her service continues. Um, she's not been destined for DCOM yet. Uh, we will see what Congress decides in the future. All right, CG56 San Jean Cinco. Uh, she is keel laid in 24 July 1985. She's launched in November 1986. Uh, commissioned in 23 January 1988. Home ported in Norfolk, Virginia. Her first deployment isn't until 1989, and she goes to the Med. In 1990, she returns to port when Iraq invades Kuwait, and she has to turn around in five days. Uh, after she's been deployed for a long time, the ship is out of food. You know, the crew is tired, ready to go see, see their family. But Saddam Hussein has different plans for him, and they managed to restock that entire ship and get it ready for war in five days. That is an immense logistical achievement by uh, CG 56 here that they need to be recognized for, because that's what it takes to win wars is to be able to go out and fight, be deployed for months at a time. And in five days, turn around and do it again. And that's what they do in 1991. Uh, They also shoot two Tomahawk missiles during desert storm. And then throughout the nineties, she's deployed over and over again to the med uh, all the way through 2001. In 2010, she rescues five crew from pirates off the coast of Somalia. Anti-pirate patrols are just as common as anti-drug patrols uh, for these types of ships. And they're out there saving crews and smashing pirates all the time. In 2012, she does collide with submarine USS Montpelier uh, in the Jacksonville operating areas. Uh, She suffers damage to the sonar dome and has to go back into dry dock to get it repaired. Cost about $11 million to do that. In 2020, she's the first U.S. ship to exceed 160 consecutive days at sea. That is a long time without setting foot on shore. And uh, that was during the COVID restrictions. So not only were they at sea for a long time, they had to wear their masks the entire time, taking their masks off only to eat, to sleep, to shower. But imagine wearing your mask 24 hours a day for 160 days at sea. That's what they did. And my hat's off to them for doing it. Sadly, she is on the chopping block. She will be decommissioned next year, 2020. CG-57, Lake Champlain. Hercules laid in 3 March, 1986, uh, launched in April 1987, and commissioned in 12 August 1988. Uh, She's home ported in San Diego. In 1989, she lost part of her bow in a storm rounding Cape Horn, South America. So she's built you know, over on the East coast, but she's stationed on the West coast. And so while rounding the tip of South America, she runs into a storm and it damages her, her bow. 
1991, she goes on a Persian Gulf deployment. Uh, 1994, she does Westpacs, and again in 2000, this time with USS John C. Stennis Battle Group. John C. Stennis, big, big aircraft carrier. Uh, in 2001, the exercise Colonel Blitz uh, is an experimental littoral battle space concept technology. So they're beginning uh, in the early 2000s with this littoral warship idea, and they're testing tactics and equipment that they may install in this future littoral combat ship uh, using Lake Champlain and other ships as well. She's not the only one. In 2002 to 2003, she's deployed to the Persian Gulf to support Enduring Freedom and Southern Watch. Uh, 2007, an explosion occurred while in port in San Diego. So an investigation happened, and they discovered that they had high levels of oxygen in a pump room. So they weren't, um, you know, ventilating the ship properly at all. Uh, the contractor who was welding with hot work was unaware of the high concentration of oxygen and essentially set the air on fire around him and sailors. Seven people were injured, including sailors. Uh, the person, the contractor, who was paid to go through the spaces daily and do air samples to make sure there was no high levels of toxins or any other chemical, uh, was not doing his job. He was writing down that he was doing it without actually doing it. And it resulted in seven injuries. He was fired. In 2017, there was a collision with South Korean fishing vessel, but there was no damage. And the South Korean fishing vessel simply drove away. So there was really no consequences either. But just know that, you know, the fishermen clearly were not paying attention. Oh, and into the Lake Champlain's defense in this occasion, they did sound the ship's whistle, which is this huge like train horn sound. And the South Korean fishing vessel acted as if they weren't even there and just ran right into them. Clearly, they just weren't paying attention. They were drunk. They were asleep. Who knows what they were? Uh, but they ran into a American cruiser and then went about their way, kept fishing. And in 2021, uh, her service continues. Uh, eventually, all these Ticonderogas will be decommissioned, but she is not on the chopping block as of the time of this recording. CG-58, the Philippine Sea. Her keel's laid in 8 April 1986. She's launched in July 1987 and commissioned in March 1989. Her home port is in Mayport, Florida. She begins her life in the Navy uh, serving Desert Storm and Desert Shield in 1990-91. After that, she deploys back to the Med. In 1993, she goes to a dry dock for a maintenance period before beginning a regular rotation with deployments to the Med and the Adriatic Sea. The Adriatic Sea is in the Mediterranean, by the way. Um, and she has another maintenance period in 1995. So kind of a routine, you know, de deploy, come back, rest, you know, maintain, go to the dry dock in one of these cases in 1993, and then get ready to go back to sea again. And she's going to sea every other year. And so as we get deeper and deeper into this Ticonderoga class, we can see the operational tempo become a little more rhythmic and a little bit higher tempo. In 1998, she performs a sink X of the USS Richmond K. Turner. That's an old cruiser, CG-20, off the coast of Puerto Rico. In 1990, she took part in operational Allied Force for the Kosovo War. In 2001, she's deployed to the Arabian Gulf with the USS Enterprise. She also launches Tomahawk trucks into Afghanistan, hitting Al-Qaeda training sites. In 2004, Philippine Sea deploys, um, took down two drug smuggling vessels at the same time. And this is the first time that a Ticonderoga has done this, is that the drug smugglers were trying to run through the area with multiple ships, and they managed to snag two of them at the same time. But sadly, in 2010, she failed her in-serve. No details were given, but some of her equipment did not work, and so she had to fix that. Apparently she did because the very next year she goes on de deployment to the Baltic where she's participating in war games with NATO fleets. She also deploys in the same year down to Yemen where an RPG strikes the superstructure and sets it on fire. That's from the, one of these little pirate boats that float around trying to capture tankers and other civilian vessels that are in the Gulf of Aden or anywhere around Somalia, Horn of Africa. And they just straight up shoot her with an RPG from the distance. Um, they do manage to rescue 25 crewmen from the pirates after they um, destroy them with their five inch weapons. Uh, so they did uh, find some civilians among the pirates after they attacked them. In 2014, uh, she fires Tomahawk strikes into Syria. 
not widely reported here in the States, but they were involved in Syrian strikes in 2014. Now we're moving forward into baseline three, Ticonderoga. This is where we're going to get some advancements in the Spy-1, Bravo, and Delta variants of the radar. Increased capabilities with some new consoles, the UYK-21 consoles. Uh, it's all going to be run by new computers. Gone are the old Yuck-7s. Now is the new hotness of the Yuck-43 and 44. Digital computers, Yuck-44 is a compact digital computer, often associated with fire control systems. Yuck-43 is the general processing computer for all systems Navy. Yuck-43s are very common in the Navy, especially in the weapons department. CG-61 will get the SPY-1D radar, and that's going to be the most advanced uh, on the Ticonderogas here. Uh, the new SM-2 Block uh, 4 Alpha theater defense missile becomes available starting with Baseline 3. All right, so here is the SPY-1 Bravo Delta radar. The antenna is 12 feet in diameter and height. It's kind of a little, little boxy shape thing. Uh, the ballistic missile track and intercept capability is in, is is available now. Uh, they they used to be able to track you know very high altitude targets we talked about, but now we can get up into that ballistic missile range and shoot it down. Special high energy waveform and signal processing allows this to happen without increasing signal strength. In other words, they did not add power to the radar; they changed the way the radar worked to get this new capability. So this is an internal change to the beamformer processor. Yeah. Uh, they improved, uh, evolves Sea Sparrow missile capability and all future Ticonderogas will receive these version of this uh, Spy-1 Bravo Delta. And here in the graphic, you can see exactly how uh, it works with sea skimming weapons being detected, tracked, illuminated with the fire control radar. Remember I told you about the fire control radars that do that, uh, they work in junction with the spy one and they guide the uh, sm2s into the uh, incoming sea skipping missiles and the same way it works with ballistic missiles too here's some display pictures for you uh, i got this out of the manual for um, human machine interface design basically it's a thesis out of uh, the naval institute um, the positioning of the buttons and the screens is very carefully calculated so that you don't exhaust your operator looking left, right, up and down to get important information. The most important thing to the operator is right in front of his face. And then the further away you get from that left, right, up, down are less important bits of operations or information. There's a lot of science behind human machine interface. Here's the Yuck 43 and Yuck 44 computers. Man, am I familiar with these? <laughs> I spent a lot of time punching numbers into the into these guys. Um, basically, the tall one you see on the left, that's the Yuck-43. Uh, the bottom half of that is just huge, heavy mechanical hard drives. Um, and the reason why they're so huge and heavy is not only do they store a lot of data, but they're designed to withstand shock. Like if you bump your computer at your house, you may crash your computer. These computers cannot afford to crash, no matter how much they, they get bumped. You know, and plus they're EM shielded as well. So the actual computing part is like the top half of that. Uh, the very top is like a big vent on the tall one. Uh, and then the bottom part is storage. And, and it's all water cooled. Yep, all water cooled. Uh, the Yuck 44 on the right has a huge vent on the bottom. That's all heat sink on the bottom with forced ventilation blowing air out. And it's hot. Like if you walk by this thing on the Yuck 44, the square one on the right, and that hot air hits your arm, it's uncomfortable. It may not burn you right away, but you don't want to stand there. It's that hot. These, the, these machines run very hot because they're doing a lot of calculations and stuff. But the one on the left is water-cooled. And it, it, it has fans as well, but uh, is also water-cooled. Anyway, so here's the SM2 Block 4 Alpha. This is the bee's knees as far as SM2 goes. Um, this is for uh, theater ballistic missile defense. It has, uh, it's basically an Aegis extended range using um, the Mark 72 rocket booster there on the bottom that gives it the extra altitude it needs to get into that theater defense realm. It basically has improved everything. Radome, improved guidance. Uh, they added an infrared seeker uh, as well as radar guidance. The autopilot can calculate corrections faster. That's very important 
for intercepting um, basically a bullet with a bullet is what you're doing here. The speeds at which these missiles fly at each other is incredible. So you need to have very precise autopilot. And adding the IR seeker to help fine tune the uh, intercept point is, uh, is really good, especially at the last minute. They have a modified Mark 45 fuse and a modified Mark 127 warhead. So that gives uh, maximum dispersion of, uh, of the explosion to disable the incoming weapon. Very advanced design. This is the top of the line as far as SM2 uh, missiles go. Let's begin with CG-59, the USS Princeton. Her keel's laid in 15 October 1986. Uh, she's launched in October 1987, commissioned in February 1989. She's home ported in San Diego, California. Uh, she participates in uh, Desert Storm, but was struck by two influenced mines during that time in, in, in the Persian Gulf. It cracked her superstructure and jammed her rudder, and the, and the port shaft started leaking water into the engine room. But the crew acted amazingly, and they saved the ship. Not only did they save the ship, the ship was able to continue her mission after being struck by two naval mines. That's incredible. So well done to the crew and the construction of the ship. Uh, it was well built and well maintained. From 1999 to 2000, she does a complete overhaul and modernization. That's right in the window to be getting smart ship as well. So we can assume that she got that at that time. In 2001, at sea in the Arabian Gulf with the USS Carl Vinson Battle Group, uh, she conducts missile strikes and boarding missions in the Arabian Gulf in 2001. In 2004, she tracks an unidentified aerial phenomenon off the coast of Southern California. Uh, this is kept secret for many years, but came out relatively recently at the time of this recording and has been called the Tic Tac video. The Tic Tac video is recorded from an F-18, but that F-18 was investigating detections made by the USS Princeton. In 2003, uh, she does a Westpac in the Persian Gulf. In 2005, she rescues a crew from pirates in Somalia again. And in 2010, uh, she rescues hostages from the MV Magellan Star in the Gulf of Aden. That's a big uh, tanker ship you see there. CG-60 Normandy. She's keel laid in 7 April 1987. She's launched in March 1988 and commissioned 9 December 1989. Home ported in Norfolk, Virginia. In 1990, she first deploys to Desert Shield and Desert Storm. In 1993, she deploys again to the Adriatic Sea in support of UN efforts in Yugoslavia. That whole region in the early 90s was a bit of a mess. Bosnia, Herzegovina, Slovakia, it's all on fire. In 1994, she celebrated the 50th anniversary invasion of Normandy with veterans. This is a very prestigious event. It's the 50th anniversary of the namesake of the ship. They have a lot of World War II vets on board and ashore. And uh, there is a huge naval presence from all, all navies in the area. And she's one of many. A big, big honor in 1994 to uh, be off the coast of Normandy with the veterans that were there 50 years prior. In 1995, she deploys to the Med and again in 1997. Uh, the 1997 deployment extends to the Persian Gulf. That's very common. Whenever you go to the Med, you go to the Adriatic Sea sometimes. Sometimes you go down through the Suez Canal into the Arabian Gulf. And in this case, all the way around to the Persian Gulf. In 1998, she goes into Dry Dock and Overhaul. Uh, and she comes out of Dry Dock and Overhaul in 2000 and joins the Joint Task Force for Atlantic Deployment. That is just basically a large war game that encompasses most of the Atlantic. It can go anywhere from the Caribbean Sea all the way up to off the coast of Europe. Uh, and it's a, just a very large uh, war game or cooperation exercise between all sorts of navies, including NATO navies, just to make sure that we can operate and communicate, you know, together, practice that skill. Because communication between anybody, but especially warships, that ability degrades over time as people move around and transfer off ships and onto other commands you know the people that do the war games in 2000 are not going to be the same people that do the war games in 2002 you're going to have some turnover there so they do these war games regularly to make sure that everybody is on the same page 
In 2002, the Computex deployment, this is a complex unit training, that's what Computex means, uh, with naval fire support in the Caribbean Sea. This is usually done with the Marine Corps. We've done this off the coast of Africa, uh, again, on, as a training exercise. This isn't, it's real ammunition being fired at an empty beach. Uh, but what we do is we coordinate with the Marines and we provide spotting information for Marine Corps fire. And then they call in fire from us and uh, we use live ammunition, at least in this case. And it is very intense because conducting and coordinating an amphibious operation is one of the most difficult things you can do in, at the operational level of warfare. In 2005, uh, she deploys back to the Mediterranean. In 2007, she circumnavigates Africa, going through the Suez Canal and back again. In 2010, she deploys to the Persian Gulf, two years later the Baltic Sea. Uh, presumably, she did uh, Baltic Ops during that. Uh, if, you, if you ever go to the Baltic Sea, you're probably going there to take part of that war game. In 2015, she deploys to the Arabian Sea with USS Theodore Roosevelt. And in 2020, she uh, captured a small boat of Iranian SAMs near Yemen. That made the news here locally. Um, so Iran has been supplying uh, the civil war in Yemen uh, with all sorts of weapons, suicide drones, you name it, RPGs. Um, all sorts of you know, weapons are coming out of Iran for these proxy wars in surrounding countries, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, those are often fueled with ammunition and weapons from Iran. And so intercepting this one small boat, not only exposed that that was going on, really showed how much we're missing. You know, we caught this one, but how much got through before we found it. CG-61 Monterey. Hercule was laid in 19, August 1987, uh, launched in 1988, and commissioned on the 16th of June, 1990. Her home port is Norfolk, Virginia. Her first deployment was in 1994 to the Med. In 1996, she deployed to the Adriatic Sea. And in 1998, she did the Joint Task Force exercise with John C. Stennis. Again, that's that large exercise in the Atlantic that spans you know, hundreds of miles. Uh, in 1990, she's deployed in the Arabian Gulf. And in 2001, she sails to New York City to support recovery efforts after the 2011 attacks. Again, you know, a, re a homecoming, if you will, after all these fleet weeks have been hosted by New York City, rolling out the red carpet for these sailors for year after year, uh, being able to go to New York and provide help after a terrorist attack was, you know, an obligation, but also a great honor uh, for a lot of these uh, sailors. Just to give back a little bit. In 2009, assisted Germany Navy in arresting pirates near Africa. So she's not always in charge. She's the Tycho. She is the uh, air defense commander, uh, but she's not always the flagship. And in this case, Germany had the flagship, had command authority. And so we were simply providing an assisted role off the coast of Africa. In 2011, uh, she's deployed to the Med as part of the ballistic missile shield. So this is the first time where we're deploying for specifically to defend countries from ballistic missile attack in 2011. And it's, it's in the Mediterranean and we're protecting parts of Europe from any aggressor, you know, wink, wink, looking at Russia, but you know, we're just protecting, you know, them from, from, from shortened in intermediate range mi missiles. In 2017, she deploys to the Arabian Sea and the very next year she deploys back to the Med but this time in 2018, she launched a Tomahawk strike into Syria. And she is scheduled to be decommissioned in 2022 after a pretty long and prestigious career there. So she's got a couple firsts, including that ballistic missile shield. That is, uh, that's very important. CG-62 Chancellorsville. Keel laid in 24 June 1987. Uh, launched July 1988 and commissioned November 1989. Look how close together these dates are becoming. They're really beginning to pump out these Ticonderogas after building them for a decade. They're getting very good. The experience level of the shipyard workers is really beginning to show here. Her home port is in San Diego, California. In 1993, she does a Westpac, including the Arabian Gulf deployment. In 1995, two years later, she does a Westpac again. She comes back, she rearms, refits, trains a little bit deploys again in 1997 this time to the caribbean sea every time they go there that's drug ops 
So they're doing something over there with the looking for the drug smugglers. In 1998, she is in overhaul and home ported uh, over to Yokos- Yokosuka, Japan. And that happens after her overhaul. In 1999, she begins Westpac, which is fun for a lot of sailors. A lot of Liberty ports in Westpac. In 2001, she's dry docked for modernization. In 2002, she comes out of dry dock and spends July 4th in Vladivostok, Russia, doing a port visit, celebrating U.S. independence with Russia. This is, again, us you know, holding out an olive branch to Russia, trying to improve relationships with us. Oh, and during this time, in the 90s anyway, they're visiting our ports as well. So this is going both ways. In 2003... Uh, we host Chinese warships in Guam for the first time ever. So we're not trying to just improve relationships with one country. We're also working with China, including we're, we're also inviting China to do war games with us in the early 2000s. In 2004, uh, there's a dry dock period for about a year. Uh, she comes out of that and does talisman saber exercise in the Pacific. That's the big one that includes uh, Australia, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, and of course, Japan. In 2006, she's moved back to San Diego, California as their as her home port. So she only spent a decade or so over there in uh, Japan. In 2011, assisted recovery efforts in Japan after tsunami. In uh, 2013, a uh, drone tracking exercise. The drone was lost control and crashed into the ship. So this was not a live fire exercise or else they would have shot the drone down. But what they'll do is they'll launch a drone, fly it through the fleet and simulate it is a cruise missile attack or, you know, low flying air helicopter or whatever. And it's just to train the system and the operators into tracking high speed, low flying uh, things. Well, in this case, the drone lost control. It lost its command link. And that might have something to do with the electronic warfare suite that we can't talk about. <laughs> and, uh, but happened to be on a course going towards the chancellorsville whenever it lost uh, control and crashed. And there was really no damage, just kind of a funny um, event that happened while at sea. Or maybe some enlisted man just got tired of uh, being, you know, rung to quarters so he could track a drone. He wanted some sleep, so he fried it with the electronic warfare system. I'm not saying he did that. I'm just saying he could have. In uh, 2019, a Russian destroyer came close to ramming in the East China Sea. So this is where, you know, relationships between us and Russia clearly have taken a change between uh, the early 2000s and the 2019 Uh we're doing a freedom of navigation exercise up there in the picture on the right hand side where we're actually retrieving a helicopter whenever the Russian destroyer comes alongside uh, acts as if it's going to ram them, but then turns away at the last second. Our ship just maintains course and speed the entire time. Very unprofessional navigation by them. Clearly their intent was to try and get our ship to change course, um, but we didn't. Sadly, the Chancellorsville is planned for decommission, but not until 2026. So we're going to get a few more years out of her before she's finally retired. CG-63 Cowpens. Her kills late in 23 December 1987. She's launched in March 1989 and commissioned in March 1991. Uh, in 1994, she's awarded Top Readiness for Fleet. That's a very prestigious award. And when I say for fleet, I mean the entire Navy not just the fleet she's attached to. So it is restricted to surface ships because there is one of these awards for submarines as well. But as far as every surface combatant, including aircraft carriers in the, in the Navy, she earns the top readiness award. Very prestigious. 1996, she goes to the Arabian Gulf deployment with the USS Kitty Hawk. In 1997, she has a live fire exercise off the coast of San Diego. It's a very common place to do that. There's a live fire range right there. Uh, 1998, she goes on Westpac, and in 99, she comes into dry dock for modernization, probably getting smart ship installed if they didn't install it whenever they built her, which they probably did that. She could be getting um, the uh, CEC with a cooperative engagement uh, capability. In 2001, uh, visits Vladivostok, uh, Russian naval exercise. They actually do exercises with the Russians after the visit. In 2003, she launches Tomahawks into Iraq. That's part of the second Iraq war. Happened in 2003. In 2004, she goes back into dry dock for a maintenance period as well. In 2011, she provides humanitarian assistance to Japan after the tsunami. 
In 2023, I'm sorry, 2013, while observing the PLA and maneuvers in the South China Sea, Chinese Navy instructed Cowpens to leave the area, sent an amphibious transport dock to block the Cowpens as big dock ship gets in her path. And so she's forced to stop. So the Cowpens does that, but she still monitors the exercise just at a dead stop uh, until the Chinese are finished. In 2015, she transfers to Naval Sea Systems Command for modernization. Uh, she's expected to see service until the 2040s. So uh, she is one of the Tycos that's going to last the longest, again, unless something changes. Every year, it seems, or every other year, Congress uh, comes out with what ships or approves what ships will be decommissioned. And recently, that's changed a lot. But as of now, she's not on the chopping block. All right. CG-64, the Gettysburg, keel laid in 17 August 1988, July, launched in July 1989, commissioned in June 1991. 1993, she's deployed to Haiti to enforce a trade embargo. Haiti's uh, coming under a lot of scrutiny because of the violence there, the corrupt government. And uh, so the UN says, hey, we're going to crack down. And the USS Gettysburg is there to enforce UN resolutions and embargoes. 1994, she goes to the Baltic Sea for deployment exercise Balt Ops 94. She also uh, is sent to aid the Achille Lauro. Remember her? She was the one that had the terrorist attack. Well, the Achille Lauro, being a passenger vessel, uh, is still operating in 1994. Uh, but this time she's in the Indian Ocean and Somali pirates are, you know, are failing to board her, uh, but they set her on fire instead. So after they couldn't get aboard, they shot rockets or did something to her to try to burn her down. And they were very successful. Um, she did sink days later, but uh, they were able to get there and save a lot of the crew and before she sank. In 1998, she deploys the Arabian Gulf. In 1999, she deploys the Adriatic Sea. In 2000, the Atlantic deployments with the USS Enterprise. 2001, she conducts joint operations with NATO navies in the North Atlantic. And in 2003, she does drug enforcement off the coast of South America, again in 2006 and in 2008. I believe I was with her uh, in 2006. That, that, that about fits the right timeline as to when I was doing drug ops down there, too. So it's likely that I was on a submarine working with her. Hmm. In 2009, deployed to the Gulf of Aden through, uh, to fight pirates. So she did some pirate ops in 2009. 2011 NATO exercise training flag officers. Uh, this is a real interesting one is because she is a flagship with all the technical bells and whistles. And, you know, they can bring flag officers on from other countries as well and just train doing the, you know, the fleet coordination because just because you're a high ranking officer doesn't mean you magically know how to do your job well. You, know, you still need training at all levels in the Navy. So they use her in 2011 as an at sea exercise training platform for flag officers uh, in 2015 uh, modernization begins they upgrade the network systems uh some uh, an upgrade called cans uh and it's just some internal upgrades nothing really major but it's uh it's important to know that they're throughout the life of these ships even though we're going from baseline you know one to two to three here we're getting additional improvements and the improvements that are made in one ship, if they're successful like this one will be in, made in the next baseline. It will become part of the next baseline. Okay. In 2021, a fire on board while undergoing maintenance injured four sailors. And uh, it's still in a maintenance period now from that fire on board. She's in a dry dock or in a maintenance availability right now. Uh, we'll see what she does whenever she comes out, but that's where she is at the time of this recording. In a shipyard somewhere. Baseline for Ticonderoga. This is the top of the line, ladies and gentlemen. This is the evolution of the Ticonderoga class. This is what we've been striving for, and we have come here. This is the pinnacle of Ticonderoga capability. She has the UYS-20 data display systems. Those are high-definition displays, very good for um, all the operators, it's got a new UI system. She has the latest sonar system, the uh, SQS-53 Charlie. Very long range, very powerful. Uh, it will snap you up if you get close to it. It's basically an area denial of submarines. They put so much active energy into the water, you can't get close to the fleet. Yeah, that's that's how they, they operate that. has the SQR-17 data processor for um, the helicopter and towed array. They have the new SM3 Block 1 and 2 missile. We're going to talk about that. And 
the pinnacle of standard missiles, the SM-6. The SM-6 coming up. But let's talk about my favorite thing, the SQS-53 sonar. I made the lecture. I can choose what order we talk about things. This provides greater range, like I said, and detectability with half the computer footprint on board. It has a very high source level. In other words, it's loud as hell. <laughs> it's got fully stabilized beams. And what that means is um, as the ship rocks and rolls left and right, there is a gyro input to the beam former that says, oh, we're leaning a little bit to the right because it's a big wave. And it stabilizes the uh, beams of the sonar as they go out so that if it's supposed to be going out at a negative five downward air angle it stays at negative five even though the ship is rocking around that's what fully stabilized means convergent zone mode now sq 53 has got convergent zone mode in the previous versions but now it's really good and they can take advantage of it they can begin searching for your submarine oh god okay in excess of 40 miles but it's a hell of a lot longer than that um you know they can begin searching for you long before you ever get in the same ocean of them if it's deep water that's how that works anyway computer aided detection because today's sonar operator is not as good as they used to be they need the computer to point out the targets for them this will do it this will literally tell the operator here's a target here it's right here yep and all all the operator has to do is recognize that arrow and be like oh, oh thank you and then gain the target and there you go oh and something else the computer does gotta be careful here uh it begins recording the target before the operator does anything. So whenever the operator finally decides to do something, it's already got all the data because the, the uh, computer knows that it's going to start detecting the, the, the target long before the operator will do something about it. And so it begins saving 10, 15, 20 seconds of data uh, all to the hard drive so that whenever it is finally gained, all that data that's been going on for the past few minutes all goes to fire control. Yeah. So it's as if they gained it whenever the computer initially gained it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyway, uh, it has reconfigurable consoles, which means the consoles are universal. Uh, so whatever one console can do, all the other consoles can do it. And that's really good for reliability. If one console goes down, you don't lose capability. You know, they all do the same thing. They have three consoles, as you see here in the picture. Okay, it's the most advanced sonar, a surface sonar in the US inventory, and it's extremely capable, and it does way more than I'm telling you. Uh, it's so good. So good. But let's talk about missiles. This is the SM-3. We haven't talked about the SM-3 yet. We've been talking about SM-1 and 2 to up to now. But now we got the SM-3. This is new hotness. This is, uh, they have phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, just know that there's, there's basically a block one and a block two, okay? And, and we're really worried about, we're going to be using the uh, SM-3 block two alpha, primarily uh, they will use some of the other earlier ones uh the the block three sorry block two bravo that's got a large diameter booster and only works if you have a modified mark 41 vls which in some cases is the land-based uh vls system but the majority of the sm3s are going to be uh block one bravo and block two alpha all right, and here's the SM-6. The SM-6 is the pinnacle of the United States missile technology right now, naval missile technology right now. It is extremely capable long-range missile. It has a huge Mark 72 booster on the butt that can throw this thing into space. And uh, from there, it's got another rocket motor that pushes it even farther. And then in the very nose, you've got the ordnance section, the guidance section. That's all from the SM-2. But the SM-6 guidance and ordnance is, uh, is just, you know, much more sensitive, much, much more accurate. That's a picture of it there. It's a beautiful missile. All right, so let's talk about the Ticonderoga Baseline 4, the one that shoots all the things. CG-65 Chosen, uh, keel laid in 12 July 1988, is launched in September 1989, commissioned 12 January 1991, a home port in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. In 1993, she deployed to the Persian Gulf for Operation Southern Watch. Uh, 1994, she's deployed to the Arabian Gulf. These are all without incident. Just regular deployments every couple years. In 1997, she does the Joint Task Force Pacific Exercise with Allies. Uh, 1999, Air Defense Commander for USS Constitution Battle Group does a Westpac. Sailors visit in ports doing exercises with other navies. That's what Westpac's all about. It's, uh, it's a good time. 
Uh, 2000 received a significant systems upgrade during a maintenance period. Uh, year 2000 would be, you know, CEC. They have all, they were built with smart ships, so they don't need that. Um, they probably got cans. So that's what they're getting there. Uh, 2001 deployed to the Persian Gulf for Operation Southern Watch a second time because that operation goes on year after year. That is the post first Gulf War resolution. That's what that is there. In 2008, she did fail her in-serve inspection, unfit for sustained combat operations. That's not a statement you want to hear on any inspection, especially if you're the crew member or the captain. The corrective action is public knowledge. They had to replace both their barrels to their five-inch guns. So, uh, you know, implying that they didn't work. They had not been maintained properly. Uh, who knows what their cause is, but they had to replace the barrels. And after they did that, they were fit for service again because they deployed to the Gulf of Aden where they rescued three fishermen found in the water. And this is an interesting story because the fishermen who were of Somali descent said that Somali pirates had come out to their fishing boat and took their boat. So these Somali pirates do not just take over tankers and sailing boats that rich people sail around the world. No, these these pirates will attack anybody, including their own fishermen, fishermen. And they basically took their fishing boat and threw them in the water. Yeah, so they were very lucky to be found. In 2013, they passed their in-serve inspection. So good for them. In 2014, they supported the Canadian ship HMCS Protector after a fire in her engine room. So uh, it's not clear what kind of support that was, but they uh, supported her in some ways. In 2016, uh, she moved home port back to San Diego, California. And then in 2019, she moved again to Seattle, Washington, but this time she did it for modernization. She's going to be in the dry dock shipyard period for years, probably five, and uh, she's going to get all new equipment. And that's what's going on right now at time of this recording. Uh, the CG-65 Chosen is in uh, a maintenance availability. She will be in there for estimated four more years, and we'll see what she does when she comes out. CG-66 Hugh City, keel lid in 20 February 1989, rather, launched June 1990, commissioned in 14 September 1991, home ported in Mayport, Florida. She deployed to the Med as Air Warfare Commander for USS Theodore Roosevelt. 1994, deployed to Haiti to impose UN sanctions. 1995, deployed to the Red Sea as Air Warfare Commander. 1996, Balt Ops 96 exercise, working with NATO fleets, doing some crew exchange. In 1997, she deployed to the Med as Air Warfare Commander for USS John F. Kennedy Character Strike Group. 1989, demonstrates ability to kill targets tracked by other vessels. This is part of that cooperative engagement I've been telling you about. The CEC is a huge capability. Um, and that's basically, you take the target of another vessel that's on your data link and you shoot it down. You attack it. You take that information, you develop a fire control solution, and you take action on it. They have demonstrated the ability to do that as early as 1998. 1999, uh, Caribbean Sea Deployment and Balt Ops, all in one year. That's a good time, because in the Caribbean Sea, um, you're visiting ports. You're going to Puerto Rico. You're going to pull into San Juan, if not Roosevelt Roads. Roosevelt Roads, the um, the Navy base down there, closed. So, But you can still pull into San Juan. And then with the Balt Ops... Um, up in the Baltic. Yeah. You could pull into all, all sorts of bases up there. Good times for the crew. These are really good deployments. One operationally, they're fantastic. It's a great experience. Uh, they're great for their career. They're getting all these ribbons and experience. And then the crew's also enjoying all the shore time in areas that the average enlisted American would probably never get to visit. And they're getting to see these cultures and areas of the world essentially for simply serving on board a ship in the Navy. In 2000, they do a Unitas. These sailors might be the happiest sailors in the Navy at this point because now they're going to go around South America. Yeah, they're doing drug ops, but they're also visiting a lot of ports in South America now. In 2001, they support New York City uh, with hum humanitarian efforts after the terrorist attacks. In 2002, Northeast Africa provided live fire shore bombardment for Marines during the MUEX. That's the Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit Exercise 2002. Um, we do those off the coast of Puerto Rico as well, but this one was North, uh, North Africa in 2014, oily rags caught fire in the engine room, causing $23 million in damage and 
caused them to miss deployment because they had to pull into dry dock to fix it. They relieved the XO. The investigation found the XO culpable for a uh, lack of standards and, you know, not stowing the, uh, the ships equally. And it's, this is a unique situation. You don't often see the XO get canned and not the engineer and the CO. It was a very specific, um, uh, disciplinary action in this case i'm sure there's more to that story as to why they singled out the xo but they certainly did and they took him out it's the end of his career at this point anyway in 2022 she's planned to be decommissioned so we will not see her again after that this one caught me by surprise i had to double check this one with the ship's plan to be an active uh, report to congress and sure enough there she is 2022 one of the newest ticonderogas is going away CG-67 Shiloh, uh, keel laid 1st August 1989. She's launched in September 1990 and commissioned 18 July 1992. She's home ported in San Diego, California. 1996, she launched 14 Tomahawks into Iraq, targeting SAM sites. Yep. In 1998, deployed uh, to the Arabian Gulf. And in 1999, 19, yeah, 1999, she tested the SM-3 off the coast of Hawaii. This is where they shoot a ballistic missile, often from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Obviously, no warhead. And they don't tell the ship that the when the ballistic missile's coming. They let it detect it and shoot it down. And it did. This test was a success in 1999. 2000, Exercise Pacific Blitz and RIMPAC 2000 goes off. Uh, tracked and killed a ballistic missile using data from another platform. This is just another milestone. Notice how these missile tests are becoming more and more complex. First, it was off the coast of Hawaii, but we don't know when the missile's coming. Now, we have to use another platform's sensor to provide a fire control solution for the weapon we have to shoot down a ballistic missile. And we're just making progress, getting better at killing these ballistic missiles. In 2002, they do a Westpac. 2005, they assist Indonesia after a tsunami, a terrible tsunami that killed a lot of people there, went and provided assistance for them. 2006, home ported in Yokosuka, Japan. So now she's forward deployed there. And we skip ahead a little bit here to 2017. A sailor thought missing was found in the engine room. He was hiding. An investigation exposed that there were severe morale problems on board. So something happened to this command after it was forward deployed to, to Japan. And that may not have anything to do with it. But the command climate degraded over a 10-year period to the point to where we had enlisted men not showing up for work but not leaving the ship either. Just basically walking around the ship, avoiding anyone they may know somehow, hiding during musters and field days and whatever. And uh, he hid on board the ship for a period of time until he was eventually caught. One, that says something about how big these ships are. Pretty big. Um, but yeah, it also exposed how toxic command climates can become that you push a sailor to points like that. She's planned to be decommissioned in 2024. CG-68 Anzio, keel laid in 21 August 1989, launched in November 1990, commissioned to May 1992. A home port in Norfolk, Virginia, 1994, met an Arabian Gulf deployment. She uh, did Operation Southern Watch during that time. In 1997, Bolt Ops 97, participated in that, did some crew swapping. Uh, 1998, Joint Fleet Task Force Exercise 98. That's the big North Atlantic Caribbean Sea exercise. In 2000, she, she did Dynamic Mix 2000, largest NATO exercise to date in the North Atlantic huge exercise and a lot of this has to do with the millennia uh and it's not just the united states countries around the world were like man it's a new century it's the year 2000 let's do things bigger and better and you know build an lcs program and you know china's like doubling their navy in three years for 18 years consecutive you know and so everyone's doing everything bigger in the 2000s including us our nato exercises now are getting incredibly large on the atlantic side in 2001, she does Balt Ops 01. 2003, she deploys to uh, the Gulf and does Operation Iraqi Freedom. In 2007, deployed to Gulf of Aden for Pirate Ops. In 2008, she's the flagship for Combined Task Force 51 that seized four tons of drugs from vessels in the Gulf of Oman. 
In 2016, she picked up 10 U.S. sailors after they had been detained by Iran for entering Iranian water space. And I don't know if you guys remember this story, but let me just sum it up for you. It was two fast boats of assigned to the U.S. Navy. There's a five man crew on each and they've got like, you know, cannons and small arms and they're designed to do, you know, fast attack and insertion and extraction of special forces. That's kind of their mission. They were transiting from Kuwait down to, I want to say Bahrain. Um, either way, they were transiting in the Persian Gulf and they didn't follow their GPS or something. And they went into Iranian waters. So Iran was like, sent some fast boats after them and told them, cut your engines and they didn't fight back. They didn't try to evade. They didn't figure out what was going on. They did nothing but surrender. This was a huge embarrassment. There ended up being a big investigation on this that found that the, uh, the junior officers that are the, basically the captains of these small boats, um, were poorly motivated. You know, they were dumb as a box of hammers and they didn't train their crew to do anything. And here you see pictures of the, uh, these are mostly enlisted men and one woman right there that, you know, thought they were out for a pleasure cruise apparently because whenever they were confronted they should have at least returned to friendly waters but they just surrendered it was really embarrassing anyway after that ordeal goes and they were in custody for weeks uh finally the uss anzio goes in to pick some up from iran she is to be decommissioned next year 2022 we will not have cg 68 anymore CG-69 Vicksburg, keel laid 30 May 1990, launched September uh, 1991, commissioned in 14 November 1992, home ported in Mayport, Florida. 1993, she does her first deployment to the Caribbean for drug ops. Nice little warm up deployment there. But she then gets her feet, you know, fully involved by deploying to the Med and becomes the airspace deconfliction commander for the NATO exercise there. Not exactly the same as the air defense uh, coordinator, but still a very important job, deconflicting airspace so there's no collisions and stuff like that. 1997, she deploys to the Med and the Persian Gulf. 99, she does Baltic Ops 99. In 2001, she demonstrates the capability to engage targets cooperatively in a fleet. Again, that's where another ship sees a contact. They take that information from that ship and shoot it down. 2002, she deploys to the Persian Gulf for Operation Enduring Freedom. 2014 nato maritime flagship for europe this is a huge honor where she is uh, forward deployed to the med and uh, so anytime nato goes anywhere uh, as a fleet she is the flagship of it uh, that's that's a big milestone in vicksburg's history in 2016 she enters modernization and she is still there today five years later so uh, hopefully the modernization is going well i left you a little picture there of one of the new uh, spy Delta radars that she's getting. That's the back end of it. That's the inside that you don't normally see. And uh, being a Soderman, I have no idea what any of that is. But it's new and fancy, and she's getting it. CG70 Lake Erie. Keel laid in 6 March 1990, launched in July 1991, and commissioned in 24 July 1993. She's home ported out of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. 1994, she tested the SM-2 Block 4 Alpha Theater Ballistic Missile Defense System in uh, 1994, as early as that. In 1995, she deployed to Persian Gulf for Southern Watch. Two years later, she's uh, doing a PAC JTF exercise, 97-1, where she demonstrates theater ballistic missile defense capability. The Lake Erie becomes nav C's test platform for theater ballistic missile defense she is given um test after test for all these different versions of the missiles under different conditions and she's doing really well in 1998 she intercepts another ballistic missile for testing on a pacific missile range so year after year they they keep pushing these tests on her and she's just performing outstanding in 2000 she completes additional theater ballistic missile testing in the Pacific. In 2001, she begins testing the SM-3 theater ballistic missile defense capabilities. 2002, she tested a new version of the SM-3 against a ballistic missile, and that missile test was a success. In 2004, during Westpac, she deployed with theater ballistic missile defense capability in 
the Western Pacific. So we already had one of those over in the Med, in Europe, protecting European countries from ballistic missile attack. Now we're deploying with the fleet an operational theater ballistic missile defense on board a ship in 2004 in the Pacific. In 2008, she tests another SM-3 uh, on a failing satellite. This is a satellite that's out of fuel. It's, it's going to reenter the atmosphere and burn up. They're like, hey, let's blow it up. And they did. Navy. In 2014, uh, extended maintenance period. She's in dry dock and all that. She comes out of that and deploys back to the Persian Gulf. And today, as the time of this recording, she is still operational. Lake Erie, everybody. Uh, a long history of success with CG-70. CG-71, Cape St. George, keel laid in 19 November 1990, launched January 1992. She's commissioned in June 1993, home ported at Norfolk, Virginia. 1994, MED deployment is her first deployment. In 1995, she does drug ops in the Caribbean Sea, seizes 12.5 tons of illicit material. In 1996, she moves to the Pacific Fleet, San Diego, for a cooperative engagement capability testing. That's that use another sensor from another ship thing, right? In 1997, Balt Ops 97, Royal Navy Hilo operated from her. So we got some Royal Navy sailors, pilots with their helicopter operating off the deck of a Ticonderoga. Good, good experience for everybody there. 1998, Med deployment and uh, Southern Watch operation. Uh, that's in the um, that's in the far eastern side of the mediterranean in 2000 she does cec testing cooperative engagement testing in the virginia op areas of a capes in 2001 she does balt ops over there in the baltic sea i can't stress enough how big the balt the balt ops is that is there's a huge amount of effort and resources put into that by european and nato countries whenever they do those so um just because it's got a funny name, Balt Ops, and we don't go into detail about it. Just know that it's a huge exercise. In 2003, Iraqi Freedom fired Tomahawks from the Med and the Persian Gulf over a five-month deployment. This is the first time any Navy ship has fired Tomahawk missiles from two different theaters in the same deployment. So she did it from the Med, then she went through the Suez Canal, got into the Persian Gulf, and she shot them from that side, too. And that was a first 2005. She certified to use a voyage management system. I remember when this came out, this is a big deal. This replaced paper charts on board ships and submarines with very accurate um, digital charts. So you could look down at your chart table, which was essentially a high definition television facing up at you. And you could see, uh, you know, the, the basic paper chart, but in a digital form. And the really nice thing about the VMS, Voyage Management System, is you could digitally update your charts uh, without having to get all new paper charts, which was a logistical pain in the butt. You just basically download a patch and bam, instantly, you have all new charts and they're updated. And so this is a big step forward in safety of navigation and convenience, quality of life for the quartermasters and navigators. Um, the submarines were getting it as well. This is not just a surface ship thing. Uh, 2006 firefight with Somali pirates left them all dead or dying. They basically kicked their ass. Yeah. The Somali pirates in this case, it was really strange. There was no reason for the, for the Somali pirates in their little wooden boat to attack CG 71, a freaking warship, a cruiser with guns. And they, they attacked them with AK 47s and RPGs and got their butt handed to them. Of course, by the five inch uh, guns fore and aft. Uh, I'm not sure what the Somalis were thinking, but they were wrecked. In 2010, they deployed to the Arabian Gulf to support troop surge in Afghanistan. In 2011, they rescued Iranian fishermen as their boat sank and they returned them to Iran. So here is a nice story of, you know, we found some civilians in the water against that are, you know, members of an adversary, but because they're civilians, they're going to be returned and they're not prisoners very you know unlike what happened to uh our guys that were in in iranian waters and they took them captive because they were military anyway in 2012 the u.s navy was billed eight hundred eighty four thousand dollars for a port visit to singapore this sticker shock uh became public and launched an investigation into why are we paying all this money for basic you know food and fuel uh for a three-day port visit in singapore like it should be 
a couple hundred thousand dollars maybe, but not 800, almost a million, right? And so after this investigation uh, was complete, they found that the Navy had been being overbilled repeatedly for all the port visits, uh, but specifically port visits that were owned by this one company. And what this one company would do, and the name escapes me, you have to forgive me for this, but they would bring uh, admirals and supply officers onto shore and wine and dine them. They would give them the best food, five-star restaurants, hotel accommodations. It was really nice. And in exchange for that, they would hand them the bill, not for the dinner that they were at, but the bill for their ship being you know, refueled and re- resupplied at the pier down the road. And that bill was always something insane like this, like $800,000 for some freaking diesel fuel and bananas, you know. But, you know, the Navy officers were looking the other way because they they were being treated like kings. And this went on for years. Uh, The guy who owns, uh, who kind of ran this operation, ended up going to jail. And a few of the retired, now retired officers who were implicated in the investigation uh, went to court, but I don't believe any of them went to jail. But I know the ringleader, the civilian guy who was profiting from this, he, he's in federal prison right now. <laughs> Probably going to be there a long time. Anyway, in 2015, uh, they had a Fleet Week visit to San Francisco. That's always fun. So it's not just New York City that does Fleet Week. It's a lot of the major cities uh, around the world do it. And in 2021, time of this recording, uh, Cape St. George service continues in the U.S. Navy. She's not on the chopping block. CG-72, Valet Golf, uh, keel laid in 22 April 1991, launched in June 1992, commissioned September 1993, home ported in Norfolk, Virginia. 1988, completed sea trials, and she also did uh, Balt Ops. So right from sea trials, she goes across the Atlantic to the Baltic Sea and uh, takes part in those exercises. 1999, the following year, she deploys to the Adriatic. In 2001, she's in New York City Harbor, uh, helping them recover from those terrorist attacks. Look at all the Ticonderogas that went to New York City uh, because of the close relationship uh, the Navy and the sailors have with uh, the Fleet Weeks uh, from New York City. They were tripping over each other to try and help. Uh, They also sent hospital ships. You know, the Navy really showed up in force after the 2011 attacks. Very proud of uh, of their response. In 2002, she was part of Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, In 2007, she's in the Arabian Sea doing pirate ops. And in 2009, she's in the Gulf of Aden capturing pirates who were raiding tankers. You can see a picture of some that they captured right there. That's being taken from the Valley Gulf. In 2015, she does a Persian Gulf deployment. And as of time of this recording, her service continues. CG-72 is uh, not on the chopping block. CG-73, Port Royal, the last of the Ticonderogas. Her keel is laid in 18 October 1991, launched in November 1992, commissioned 9 July 1994. She's home ported out of Pearl Harbor. First deployment she does is a Westpac with USS Nimitz. In 1997, she does Operation Southern Watch over there in the Persian Gulf. In 1998, she does theater ballistic missile defense testing near Hawaii. That test is successful. So it's not just Lake Erie doing the testing. They also have... Uh, Test is being shared among other platforms. In 2000, she deploys to the Persian Gulf. In 2001, she provides spotting information for Marines in a live fire exercise on San Clemente Island near San Diego. In 2003, she deploys to the Persian Gulf as Air Defense Commander because she's got that great you know, radar and communication capability. In 2004, exercise Sea Saber with a multinational force in the Pacific. Uh, 2008, while transiting in the Straits of Hormuz, the Iranian fast boats approached the ship and radioed, you will explode soon in broken English. Well, what they did was they uh, rotated the five inch guns in the direction of the incoming Iranian boats. And unlike the Somali pirates, the Iranian boats turned back around and went back to Iran. Uh, No shots were fired this time, but they were ready to lay down some havoc on some crazy Iranians. 2009 they ran aground after coming out of a dry dock in hawaii and this is a mess because they spend a lot of time and money in dry dock you know improving systems on the ship and they come out of the dry dock it's a windy day and it blows the ship aground well the captain 
the EXO, the officer of the deck, the entire navigation party are all relieved of duty for cause. End of their career. The term for cause is the death nail. So in 2011, Westpac, the Indian Ocean, is forced to stop due to structures um, cracking because of the grounding incident two years before. So even though they went back to repair the structure, uh, the repairs were not done adequately. So every time she goes to sea and operates for long periods of time, she can't even complete a, a deployment without going back into dry dock and needing repairs again. In 2016, after lengthy repairs, she's deployed on Westpac. In 2019, she's dry docked again because during the Westpac, they found cracks in the superstructure. So the Navy got tired of this and said, we can't repair you in a dry dock every time you go to sea for long periods of time. So in 2022, due to structure structural damage she's placed in an out of commission to reserve otherwise decommissioned in 2022 next year time this recording the most recent the newest ticonderoga getting one of the earliest retirements of any ticonderoga uh next year because of a running aground incident that happened on a windy day in hawaii final thoughts wow i love this ship this is the battleship of the missile age, an absolute chad of a warship. It's got missiles, it's got sensors, it's got communications, satellites. Ah, it can be a flagship. It is an amazing ship, the Ticonderoga class. It's an absolute icon of the Cold War. I believe that is unarguable. Um, Look at the activity we talked about with each one of these ships. They're deploying every other year in a lot of cases. A very active ship. If you're assigned on one of these, say goodbye to your friends and family because you're going to see them uh, for very short periods of time uh, between deployments. You know, it, it, But the experience the sailors get on these boats is some of the best in the Navy. And not just the exercises that they're doing, uh, but the ports they're visiting, the, the, the cultures and people that they're, you know, the cross deck training with other NATO nations, um, the opportunities on board the Ticonderoga is uh, among the best in the Navy. You know, if, if you can't make it on submarines, try to make it onto a, a Ticonderoga because you are going to experience life in a whole new way. And uh, I'm very, very impressed with these ships. It's extremely effective against ballistic missiles. Uh, Raytheon doesn't get enough credit for designing amazingly uh, accurate long-range missiles. The really the only downside the SM-6 is how expensive it is. We simply can't afford to buy a lot of them, so we don't have many of them. Uh, as good as a missile as it is, the price per missile is just way too high. So the Navy still uses the SM-2 Block 4 Alpha and the SM-3 uh, as its primary missile because it's the most reasonable cost. But if you have a real ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead on it, it's going to get an SM6 because that is your highest uh, let, you know, kill probability right there. Your KP is the highest with the SM6. Uh, a lot of these uh, Ticonderogas are still active today. That's why I could not talk about some systems. Uh, specifically, the electronic warfare system is completely off limits. Couldn't do that. Um, I know a lot about the sonar system that I couldn't talk about. I apologize for that. I told you what I could. Uh, and the current capabilities, yeah, like I said, are really highly classified. The The Spy-1 Delta, the latest variant that's on the Ticonderoga, is so effective. Um, but it's all sensitive. And maybe one day, you know, whenever all these are gone and they're declassified, I would love to do and revisit uh, this, th this topic. Because it deserves, you guys deserve to know that it does a lot more than what we talked about today. And we talked about a lot. She deployed in just about every ocean and sea around the world. She did everything from drug ops to pirate ops to, you know, enforcing UN resolutions. She was in multiple wars, you know, over in the Middle East. And uh, you know, really showed the flag. Whether we were doing, you know, port visits in Russia or operating in a few cases with Chinese fleets and war games, and then, of course, NATO. Um, she's just had a big presence over the last 30 years, in uh, 40 years, in, in the United States Navy. And I'm really proud to have uh, served on board a submarine alongside 
a ship like this. Oh, here we are at the end of probably my most ambitious uh, sub-brief lecture, the Ticonderoga. Uh, and I absolutely would not have had the time to do uh, this this brief justice without all the help from all the Patreons. Every one of you listening to this, you guys made this possible. But I need to recognize uh, the top tier people because, one, they deserve it. Two, it's part of the rewards. And I need to explain something because we have such generous supporters that I have to keep creating new tiers. Uh, this is not a problem other channels have is, um, whenever we started like three years ago, four years ago, however long it's been, God, it's been a long time. We, our top tier was division officer, uh, because some people wanted to donate, uh, $50 a month, which I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. One of those people was Scott Borg, by the way, who we're going to talk about in a second. And, um, and that was our top tier for a long time until, uh, one person who, uh, has retired and is no longer, you know, able to support at this level. But, uh, JB came along one month after we had done this for a year or two and he started giving me a hundred dollars a month, donating a hundred dollars of Patreon a month. I had to create a new, uh, tier for him called, called the department heads. And now look at our department heads. We have, you know, always four. Sometimes we have a few more department heads when people can afford to support like that. And, uh, and so that's how the department head came about. It's not that I created the tier and said, here's the hundred dollar tier. No, people came to me with the hundred dollars first and was like, make us a tier if you want to, you don't have to. And, but out of courtesy, I, you know, I did. Well, that has happened again. My God, and it's going to be the last one. No more tears after this because we have reached the top of the pinnacle. We have created an executive department tier because Scott Borg, our very first Patreon at the division officer level, uh, is this month he donated $200 in support um, of the sub brief series here, the lecture series. So thank you very much, Scott Borg. You're extremely generous. You keep uh, creating new tiers because you were the very first division officer. You were, um, part of the department heads, I believe for a while. And then here we are with the $200 tier. Now the executive department tier. So the way we're going to do this going forward is if anybody donates more than a hundred dollars a month, if it's 101, it doesn't matter. I'm just adding them to the executive department and that's, that's where you are. Um, and that's where Scott Borg is now. Uh, so it, there's no longer a dollar amount attached to the executive department. It's just anything greater than a hundred dollars and uh, a month. And, and we'll put you up there and I'll work with Patreon to figure out how that's going to work because their algorithm is very basic. It's oh my God, but I'll, I'll figure that out. Anyway, thank you very much, Scott. You're a man among giants, giants among men. I don't know whatever, whatever, whatever the good part of that analogy is. That's what you are. <laughs> and uh, my brain's fried. I just recorded this thing. Okay. Give me a break. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed it. The Ticonderoga brief was fun. I loved researching it. I knew it was going to be big. That's why I put it off for like a year, but I, I was finally like, you know what? Let's get it done. And we did. And I think I actually made the deadline, which I didn't think I would. I did not expect to make the November 1st deadline because I, I locked myself in my writing room for days. You know, my wife was knocking on the door, checking on me. That's how bad it got. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Scott Borg. You're extremely generous. I don't know what else to say. Uh, and again, thank you. Department heads. We're very generous people. Adam Morgan, Harpoon Henry, Kelly Martin, William R. Collier, Jr., of course, division officers, Alexander Huff, Brendan Ferry, Chappie James, Jason Wang, Jeremy Edwards, Joel Corrent, TJS 4000, Jeremy with extra M's, Jordan Vazraka, Josh Warnick, Robbie Stahl, Sean O'Neill, and we have a new division officer. Welcome to the wardroom, Fraser Disney. He's got that Disney money. Fraser Disney, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to it. You're extremely generous dudes, all of you and gals, everybody. And uh, it doesn't matter. Even if you guys are tier one, listen, it, it all adds up and it allows me to make this my job. That's really what it's about. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you on the 15th because we got, what do we got on the 15th? We got a podcast. Oh, and I got an announcement. I'm not going to tease it. I'm not going to spoil it, but I have an announcement on the 15th. Big news coming up. See you then.